put in his computer. Okay, great. Appreciate everybody joining us. We got 30 people, which is uh, nice to know that it's not just uh, folks interested in Mickey and Donald and all the uh, the crew. Uh, let me just throw everybody on mute here before I forget. And then uh, the co-hosts should be able to unmute themselves here. I appreciate uh, them uh, joining us. We have uh, Ken Carpenter and Carolyn P Collins Peterson. I've known Ken for a number of years now. We I uh, think I first met at the D23 convention for, uh, based on the 64 World's Fair. And it turns out Kenneth and I have a bunch of interests. We're both interested in uh, Star Trek, uh, the 64 World's Fair, the Lake George, New York region, and I'm sure a few other odds and ends. So Kenneth is a, a member of the NASA team working at Goddard uh, Space Flight Center down in Maryland uh, and is uh, instrumental and he was one of the guys that helped bring the Hubble back to uh, life. So Kenneth is going to be uh, talking some about that. Carolyn also has a, a, I think you both had some JPL time and things like that, but uh, you work more as I recall on the exhibit side of things, trying to take the stuff that all the scientists do and help sell it to the rest of the world so that the, uh, the rest of the world can uh, uh, fund it and make sure the scientists can do all the things. So I know you have a lot of planetarium experience and others, and I hope you'll uh, both be uh, uh, filling us in on more than that. So for everybody uh, that joined us, uh, again, we're gonna do the usual Q&A at the end, but I was really glad that uh, Ken and Carolyn agreed to do this because photography has always obviously been a big interest of mine. And seeing the pictures, uh, th this talk came about in large part because Carol, my wife and I had been down at Goddard, had a uh, tour that Kenneth gave us of the facility. And Carol mentioned how she was blown away by the uh, Hubble pictures that were lining the wall in one part of the facility. And Carol is uh, uh, an artistic type, not a scientific type. And I was impressed on how much the pictures made a uh, reaction on her. So we asked uh, Kenneth if he would uh, you like to tell us how those wonderful pictures were done. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to uh, Ken and Carolyn. Okay, thank, thank you very much, Bill. Let me see if I can handle the technical challenge of sharing the screen. <laughs> um, okay. Well, you don't have to worry about sharing sound. Yeah. Uh, this is true. Uh, I think we, we got rid of everything that was a movie. Hopefully you see the title slide now. Yes, sir. Okay, okay, we're, we're set to go. So uh, as, as Bill said, um, Carol and I decided to uh, gang up on this one uh, to try to give you a, a little more complete picture here. The, the basic question that uh, Bill had posed to us is how are the color images that we are used to seeing made? Um, so it turns out there are uh, two different techniques used uh, on the rovers versus most other uh, space telescopes. So I will start off uh, this uh, talking about how we do that. And then uh, I'll hand over to Carolyn, who's going to talk about missions to Mars with, of course, a concentration on the latest mission, Perseverance, as, as that was uh, also requested by the audience here that we do something about that. And I figured Carolyn was in a better position to capture that. So uh, she is going to talk, uh, give you a very short history of other missions to Mars, and then uh, show you some of the highlights of the uh, current mission and its pictures. And then uh, I will show some highlights of uh, some of the best photos from Hubble Space Telescope. So the last two sections are basically showing you the results of the techniques that we talk about um, initially. So I will Go ahead here, hopefully. Okay, yeah, so how do we create color images with Hubble and other space telescopes? So for the moment, we're, we're ignoring the, the rovers and those kind of uh, observatories and just talking about Hubble and its predecessors. And the, the basic technique here is that most cameras on astronomical facilities are uh, what are called CCDs, charge couple devices. Uh, there are some other uh, devices out there, but they're basically consist of a, an array of pixels, you know, X and Y. And, you know, like with your, your cell phone camera, the more pixels, the merrier, the better resolution, et cetera. But they're typically are, uh, they just respond to all the light falling on them. 
So what we usually do, um, you get effectively what's a black and white picture, but if you wanna make a color picture, what you do is you take a set of images through different filters. So you see here uh, on the left, uh, an image that comes off in, in raw form off the telescope and it says F814W, that just means it's around 8,000 angstroms out toward the red. Uh, the next picture we took around F606W is near 6,000 angstroms, sort of in the middle of the range that the eye sees, uh, kind of greenish as we coded it there. And then the last one at uh, about 4,500 angstroms is down in the blue, kind of near the, the blue end of what the eye is sensitive to. So when we get these pictures, then we have to assign an effective color to them. Um, in this case, we know this is out in the red, so we put a reddish tint on it. This one is in the middle of the visible spectrum, so we do green, and then the final one we blue. So there's a little bit of judgment here. What you try to do is to pick a color. If you're trying to do a natural color image, like if you're trying to show what the eye would see, you try to pick a, a color that's in the middle uh, of, of the wave band here. So, uh, you know, we figure at this wavelength, that's equivalent to a red color, this is green and this is blue. And then you combine the three images uh, and into a single image and get a color composite like you see on the right here. So there are lots of, of guidelines and uh, techniques for trying to ensure you match what the eye would see as best as possible, but there is some art involved in the original color assignments to each of the individual frames and in the relative intensity with which you add them together. Okay, here's a, another example uh, showing the pillars of creation um, image. And again, we have three different images and we've assigned uh, red, orange, green, and blue to the three separate images. In this case, they're not just broadband images in the red and the green and the blue like the previous image, but they're actually filters that were chosen to pick up light for certain elements. So we see here the blue, it's labeled F2, F502N, a narrow filter around the oxygen three line. So blue light here is showing where oxygen atoms are, are, are shining in this nebula. Green is showing light from hydrogen atoms, the H alpha line, and red and orange is showing light from sulfur. So this is what's, instead of a natural color image, this is what's called representative color, where you choose colors that represent certain things. In this case, nitrogen, uh, oxygen, or sorry, oxygen, hydrogen, and, and sulfur. So it's a way of actually doing some physics at the same time as getting some very pretty pictures. And lots of time, these nebular clouds that we look at uh, with telescopes are only bright in, in very specific lines because atoms of oxygen happen to be very prevalent there, for instance, and, and heated to the right temperatures, they will shine with a lot of the light. And you see here, you get a pretty complete looking image just with these narrow filters centered on oxygen, hydrogen, and sulfur, and that most of the light is coming out in those colors. But by narrowing down around these atoms, you can find, you can get some physics information about how hot the material is and how much of these elements are uh, represented in this cloud. And you can take it beyond that. What, what you've seen and what is typically done for a standard color image is you just take a, R, a red, green, and blue image, put them together and you get the color image. But Hubble is, accesses a much broader wavelength of colors than what the eye can see. So in this case, you see we have, uh, uh, three, six, seven images, and they start in the ultraviolet, which is bluer than the eye can see, bluer than what gets through the atmosphere. So it's one reason that we have Hubble in orbit above the Earth's atmosphere is we can see colors of light that are not visible from the ground. Uh, so at the short wavelength then, the blue, extreme blue end, you've got ultraviolet light. At the other end of the spectrum, out past the red that the eye sees, you have what's called the infrared. Again, uh, light that doesn't get completely through the atmosphere. Occasionally it gets through in very narrow band passes, very narrow regions of color, but for the most part, it's blocked by the atmosphere too. So again, being above the atmosphere lets you capture that. So you have the problem of, okay, you've got all of this information stuff that the eye can see, and then you've got images that the eye normally doesn't see. 
Well, you know, if we just add them together, you're not going to see the stuff that the eye is not sensitive to. So we have to, have to collapse uh, the wavelength range and bring the ultraviolet into the short end of the blue so your eye can actually see it in the picture. And on the red end, we have to bring the infrared in. So we kind of collapse the color scale, keep it in what we call chromatic order from blue to green to orange to red. So it's, it's in the right relative ordering, but you actually get to represent this ultraviolet light, this infrared light that ordinarily the eye wouldn't see. You get to see in the center, the co-addition of all those different colors in all of the different details. Some areas that are hot and glowing will show up in some colors, like at the top here, you get the red and the purple. Um, you get the really deep red here, where you have some very cool uh, dust clouds, and you can see the spiral arms uh, in here, the swirling center, where there's a lot of active stars shining very brightly, kind of at all wavelengths, so it looks very whitish to you. So this summarizes again the, the, the three techniques that we use, the natural color that we talked about at the beginning, basically red, green, blue put together, the representative color where you take colors outside the range of what the eye can see, but keep them in the right order. Uh, this is a, a picture of, of Saturn here uh, with multiple colors uh, added in. So you can see the detailed structure of the bands and the rings and subrings uh, of Saturn. And then there's another option um, which you haven't shown here. Well, you know, we did show it in the one with the uh, oxygen, uh, nitrogen and sulfur called enhanced color, where we actually pick very specific narrow color regions to highlight something. And here we wanted to show this very thin wispy nebula in front of a globular cluster of stars, a spherical, a very dense spherical collection of stars. And to make the, the uh, nebula, which is very thin and wispy, easy to see against this very cluttered background. We gave it a bright blue appearance. Uh, that's not necessarily how it would look if you were out there um, using your naked eye, but it's a way of highlighting this material um, and making a pretty picture at the same time. Sometimes the enhanced colors are just made for the sake of art. Sometimes they're made to highlight a, a specific uh, physical reason that you want to draw attention to it. Okay, so that's how most astronomers are used to doing color images with space observatory. Uh, when Carolyn and I started talking about um, doing this and including the Mars stuff, um, I said, well, you know, I'm not sure that's how perseverance works. And she actually dug out some references, uh, which we went through and figured out that indeed, uh, perseverance uses a different technique. So in summary, the, the top hole here, summarizes what I just told you, normal observatory takes three separate pictures, put them together. But in Perseverance, and in particular, the mass cam cameras, which are the ones that uh, you're seeing most of the pictures from, here, instead of taking multiple pictures, it works more like your cell phone, where you take one picture and it captures all of the colors at the same time. And the way they do that in Perseverance is each individual pixel uh, in, on the detector is covered with a filter, either a red, a green, or a blue filter is right on top of each pixel so that each of those pixels only responds to that color of light and none of the others. So that's how you get the color information. The pattern of pixels are laid out in a two by two array. And each of those two by two arrays has one red, two green, and one blue pixel. And I can show you uh, this graphically here. So if you're looking, uh, for instance, down here in the lower uh, corner, you see there's a red pixel, a blue pixel, and two greens. And then this pattern repeats all around here. Now, of course, there is an issue with this. Uh, if you just take the raw images from this, uh, here's a, a mass cam image that we blow up here. You get this checkerboard pattern because each pixel is sensitive to a different color. It's going to record different intensities of light at that color, but it's gonna be kind of blurred, you know, pixelated like when you have a bad TV signal. Um, so what you have to do uh, is you have to interpolate between these. So if you're here and you've got a blue uh, signal here, at these positions in the picture, you have no information on the blue. So you have to interpolate between the two nearest blue diodes and say, okay, if we average this one and this one, we know what the blue is here. If you average this one and this one, you know what the blue is gonna be here. 
et cetera. So you have to do this to fill in all of the gaps. And uh, this is, a, again, another example uh, of this. And to, to basically get the image into a color picture, you have to demosaic it and get rid of these different colors. So you take the green pixels, interpolate into the places where the red and blue are, take the blue pixels, interpolate into where the red and green areas are, and then you take the red pixels and interpolate into the positions of the other two. So that way you have color information at every pixel in, in the image. It's not quite as high resolution as if you had a detector working at that image, but it works uh, really quite well. And um, okay, so that's how we get the, the basic images. And most of the images you see from mass cam are these standard human vision type red, green, blue images. Um, and that's what your cell phone camera does and it's what mass cam normally does. But there are two uh, what are called mass cam Z cameras that are capable of capturing a broader range of color. And they do it here by having a filter wheel which can go in place of this array which allows you to sample other colors. So you, uh, when you're taking the regular color imagery, you put this filter in front of the array. And uh, when you're doing the extended image, you use one of these other filters instead. So um, don't be afraid. This is the most technical slide we get into today, but I, I thought it was a good way of capturing it. Uh, so on the left is a chart that shows uh, basically sensitivity of the camera versus color. And you see there's a blue filter here, a red, uh, like green, sorry, and then a red. So normally you're seeing stuff between 4,000 and 8,000 angstroms, and that's the region that the eye is sensitive to. The Mascam Z has a bunch of additional filters, these ones that are highlighted in black, which are either narrow in the same regions or way out into the red and infrared. Now I did go into a, a little bit of a panic last night looking at this and saying, oh, wait a minute. If, you know, if we go back, here and each of these pixels is only sensitive to green or blue or red. How does putting another filter in front of it let you see something outside of those wavelengths? And it turns out after thinking about it and going back and looking at it, that's because these standard red, green and blue filters don't really cut off on the red end like they're shown here there's a, a filter that's put in front of the camera that looks clear to us that cuts off all of the red light so that when you're taking a picture, Red GB, you have this filter in front of this that only allows the visible light to get through and none of the infrared light. When you take that out of the system, that clear filter out of the system, then all of the light, including the infrared goes through and then you select inside that infrared light with these other filters. So it actually works, they're not cheating. Um, but uh, it's fun to see physics at work, shall we say. And then on the right is just a, a tabular uh, summary of this. So you've got the red, green, and blue pixels uh, centered. Uh, those nanometers are just uh, one tenth of an angstrom if you're used to angstroms instead, but basically red, green, and blue. And then these are all the extended filters where you can look out uh, into other colors to get more information on the mineral deposits and the compositions of the rocks, et cetera. The other thing you'll notice here is there are some places where the same filter is on both mass cam left and mass cam Z right. And that is done so you can do stereo images in some colors. So in most cases, they've chosen different filters to get as wide variety as possible, but they've been careful in some cases like the RGB and in specific infrared filters to use the same one. So you could get a, a nice cool 3D image um, out of it. And I would say in astronomy, when you're building a mission, whether it be a Mars rover or Hubble, the most time that is spent or wasted, but I think spent by the science teams in trying to define the mission is arguing over which filters you put on the camera. There's always more colors, more wave bands that people want than you have the ability to put on the spacecraft, either because of cost or just because the size doesn't allow you to put a bigger wheel in. And I cannot tell you how many hours of argument go in to that filter selection. Um, it's astonishing, but in the end, people come together and decide the, the best combination to, to go with. Okay, so that um, 
summarizes uh, at a high level and we can, if people have more questions in the Q&A, Carolyn and I can try to explain uh, in more detail. And um, I, I will note that I, I showed, I was talking about this to a, a colleague the other day and uh, they said immediately, oh, are you gonna talk about how New Horizons did it when it went past Pluto? It's like, oh my God, that's like a third technique, but it's very complicated <coughs> because New Horizons spacecraft was going past Pluto at warp speed. So they had a real concerns with smearing of images and they had a hard trouble getting uh, the, the color information they needed. So if somebody wants to hear about that, we'll have to you know, research that in detail and try to figure out uh, exactly how they did that uh, near, mirac near miraculous uh, uh, color imaging. Uh, for that, but in order to keep things uh, a little clearer today, we're, we're just gonna go with the two uh, basics. So at this point, uh, I'm gonna be uh, handing over uh, to Carolyn for a bit to, to talk about the Mars missions and the latest results from Perseverance. As uh, Bill alluded to earlier, Carolyn and I both worked on Hubble in the uh, early years on one of the original instrument teams that was launched back uh, in uh, original instruments that were launched uh, on the deployment mission of Hubble back in 1990. Um, I went on to uh, work with that instrument team and later with the project. Carolyn went on to be extraordinarily active in STEM um, and outreach. Uh, one of the premier science writers uh, addressing Hubble, but also a much broader range of topics uh, than Hubble. Uh, she has her, her own uh, book or two out on Hubble and as well uh, books on many other subjects as well. I will have to apologize in advance because when I show a sampling of Hubble books later in this talk, I realized I don't have Carolyn's book in there and she, she may, I may not survive the rest of the talk. So I, I'm going to let you know. <clears> that picture that's, that's on the wall of your guest room, that's mine now. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, without further so, ado, let's hand over to Carolyn and, and hear all about you. Mars. Yeah. No, and, and I, you know, you were talking about how you all argued over filter wheels. When I worked at Sky and Telescope, which I did after I left graduate school, we spent endless amounts of time arguing over false color versus real color versus, versus representative color. And, and I, we had it, editors and photo people at the magazine who kept telling us, well, those people who were doing the mission, they got their palette all wrong. You know, the artists had a different opinion than the, than the, uh, <coughs> than the scientists did. So that was kind of interesting. Um, but yeah, this kind of a look at imaging, it's, it's, it's interesting because it isn't like you just, you know, it isn't the old point and shoot anymore. There's really a lot of, you know, process that you have to get through. So the slide that you're seeing here, basically, um, I wanted to go through a little bit of the missions of Mars. There have been 75, more than 75, and I'm not going to talk about all of them. There are, are probably closer to 80 or so, but I didn't uh, really think about the ones that never left Earth orbit. So in the early years, we had a lot of problems getting to Mars and getting off of Earth orbit. And then you might get to Mars, but then your spacecraft would die or crash or, you know, there would be something wrong. And there was this feeling for a long time that Mars had this sort of evil aspect, you know, that it was, uh, he was gobbling up spacecraft. Uh, but we've been interested in exploring Mars throughout human history. And I'll get a little bit to the cultural aspects later, but essentially the in situ exploration at Mars didn't start until about the early 1960s. And before that, we all looked at it through telescopes. Um, Mars is now the most studied planet in the solar system, as you can see with the 75 missions uh, after Earth. Earth is actually the, the most studied and people don't realize that, but we've got things looking at Earth all the time, the atmosphere and the surface and everything. And thanks to that, this fascination with exploring it, we kind of jokingly say that Mars is the only world, known world solely populated by robots. So this is the list of the current working missions orbiting the planet. And I sort of went ahead and throw in the Chinese lander, which is supposed to be landing at any time. It's possible it's already landed, but they haven't told us. So, um, but, it, but this is what's working. Mars Curiosity is on the other side of the planet. Mars Perseverance is what we're going to be talking about. And then Zhurong, uh, again, is going to be landing. Zhurong is the Chinese fire god, in case anybody's interested in that. So next slide, please. Um, so why do we want to study Mars? There are a lot of reasons uh, to study Mars. These two encapsulate most of them. In particular, uh, we want to characterize the, the atmosphere, the surface, you know, everything we need to know. But the big thing is the search for water. You know, if you wanted to live on Mars, which is sort of a, a goal that we've had, you have to have water and you have to have oxygen. So we think of that 
that term is follow the water. That's what the missions, you know, we'll, we'll look at. And this is because without water, it's really tough to live on a planet. And so in our second point there, we're gathering information so that future missions will know where to, where to land, where the best places are. There are certainly water deposits on the planet underneath the surface that they can get to. You could probably make a, a, a you know, a good argument for landing near the poles uh, first to get water, but you don't, you don't just need it for water, you know, to survive on, you also need it for propulsion. So there, those are the two main reasons. If you want to ever get into a lot of the other reasons, we can certainly talk about that, but we'll be here all day if we do that. Next slide, please. So Mars is um, pretty intriguing to the public as well. Um, it shows up in our entertainment, which I wanted to tie this to Disney a little bit since we're all kind of into Disney here. And Disney has created, you know, included some pretty realistic views of the planet in some of their rides and what future exploration might look like. And of course, being Disney, they throw in a little added excitement. So one of the last times that I was at a Disney park, I rode the Mission Space attraction. And the first time I did it with Ken and his wife, we took the orange level ride, which nearly killed all of us. Um, we didn't realize as you get a little older, you probably don't want to take that ride, but but it's a great ride. I, I really liked it. So it you know it's a 2.5 G's at liftoff and trip to Mars, uh, in in the orange level ride. And so I thought it would be interesting to compare and contrast the Disney trip with Mars to what the reality is today. Before I get to the Perseverance pictures, so if you haven't taken the ride, this is an older image of the inside of the uh, orange level ride, and it gives a look at what Mars would look like through the spacecraft window. And it's a pretty decent representation through those windows. Uh, it looks like we're flying over what's a region called the Tharsis Bulge on Mars. And there, and this is a, a highly volcanic area that in the past it pumped out just immense amounts of lava. And it's made this giant bulge, which has sort of affected the, the uh, rotation of the planet. Uh, it'd be a really interesting place to go explore someday. So, but these this collection of volcanoes is there, and I think they've taken a little bit of artistic license with it and put a few more volcanoes than there really are there. But the, the largest volcano in the solar system is there, uh, Olympus Mons. So this is what Disney showed it looked like. So let's see the next slide, please. Um, in the original ride, uh, we, we went pet, whizzing pet, so we lift off and we launch from Earth. And in an earlier version, we go past the Hubble Space Telescope, which I thought was pretty cool. Then they redid the video and the second time I wrote it, uh, it included the James Webb Space Telescope, which is supposed to launch when, Ken? Uh, October-ish? <laughs> halloween -ish, Maybe, no? yeah. So, yeah. So at least Disney and us, we have faith it's going to launch. So that's, that's, you know, we go whizzing past that. And then the next slide, please. Um, so we have some adventures. We go to sleep for a while. We get to Mars. And our craft is actually, when we clear the, the, the asteroid belt that, that they think we went through, our craft is actually heading for this giant rift valley called the Valles Marineris. And I was looking at it, and I went back and actually got some grabs of it. And it looks like they modeled it pretty well after some actual mapping imagery that was done by an orbiter called the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, or maybe some of the earlier ones. So this image shows the western half of the valley, um, Noctis Labyrinthus. I'm sorry, uh, Valles Marineris, if you want to click on the name there. And um, then up at the top is uh, the Noctis Labyrinthus, which is uh, Latin for the Labyrinth of Night. So those are actually the, the actual names of the features. Disney didn't give those. Next slide, please. Uh, where are we? And so this, just, just as a contrast, this is an actual Mars image from Viking. You can see the entire Valles Marineris stretching across. If you want to just highlight it with the cursor, Ken. Um, it's pretty extensive. You could paste this over North America. It would actually span from west of San Francisco out to beyond the Atlantic coast. So a little geological background on this. It's a rift valley system, it appears to be, and it's been eroded over millions and millions of years. It's possible there was water in there. You know, that's what we want to find out. For scale, our Grand Canyon would fit in one of the little tiny side canyons up at the, you know, up at the top. It's, it's just huge. Next slide, please. Uh, Carolyn, before we go, I should point out the uh, Thursus Ridge volcanoes here. Oh, right. They're over on the, on the left there. side. Yeah. So so Disney sort of took a little artistic license and put a few more in there. Um, and, and there's some connection between the, you know, what was going on in the Tharsis Bulge and what happened at the Noctis Labyrinthus at the far west end there. So next slide, we that little red line is the route. And so it start and so it's the route goes from south to north. So it it goes up from the bottom below a region called Melis Chasma, and then it goes north across the canyon, heads across to a smaller canyon called Candor Chasma, which is 
sort of that fan shaped part coming out of the top of the canyon out of Valles Marineris. And then it ends up at a fictional base that the Disney folks place somewhere south of the crater, of, of a crater that's up to the left of that. So that's sort of the route where Disney took us. Next slide, please. Now this is the, you know, this is what the show shows us. So here we are, we're coming in over Mellis Chasma, the clouds have cleared. Now, just to be fair, you don't really see clouds like this on Mars, but again, this is a little bit of artistic license. So here's their take. They come in over Mellis Chasma and they're headed to the North Northwest. Next slide, please. And then they cross over into Candor Chasma. Candor is about where you could put the, put the Grand Canyon in one of the corner canyons. So this is, and this looks pretty true to life, you know, from some of the images I've seen. So this is north of the main body of Valles Marineris. And then from there, they weave through some canyons. And then next slide, please. They come in on the final approach to the Mars base. And I forget the name of it, but this is pretty nice. It actually looks like it's still on the edge of a canyon. It was based somewhat in part on the movie Mission to Mars, starring Gary Sinise, which is why Gary was, was the commander in the, in the orange level for a while. Um, I wasn't a big fan of the movie's premises, but I think they really nailed the look and feel of the Martian surface in there. So that's to give you an idea of sort of a fictional trip to, to, uh, to Mars. Now we're going to talk about the reality of it. So the ride planners did a pretty good job of showing us the future Mars and that looked pretty realistic. Um, it's pretty clear they took into account the mapping that had been done on the red planet. I haven't actually talked to the, to the ride designers, but I, I do know from talking to other designers and some of you who are here know that, you know, you really did a good job on researching backgrounds and what things would look like. So, so I was pretty confident about how, how good it looked. Um, but the Mars we know today doesn't yet have a base on it. It has a very tiny one called Wright Field, which we're going to get to. And even though we've sent 75 plus missions from Earth to Mars, we've really only explored a little bit of it. Next slide, please. This is a map by Planetary Society writer Emily Lakdawalva, who is a source for both of us. She, I don't know if she worked at JPL or she's just a hell of a good researcher, but she digs and finds a lot of really good information. And she made this map showing us where we've settled our spacecraft onto the surface. So I want you to notice where Ballas Marineris is. I've got a little arrow there. You know that we don't notice we don't have any spacecraft near there. The closest would be Opportunity and it's still, you know, a number of kilometers away. So there are other ones, uh, Mars 3, which is from Russia, landed quite a number of years ago. That's in the lower left. Mars 2 is sort of in the middle. Um, I want to focus more in on Curiosity, which is over on the right. Curiosity is still roving. Insight is a mission that is, um, didn't they just put that into, into hibernation, Ken, for the Martian winter? I think that's right. I think it is or is just going into it. Um, so it's, it's a spacecraft that was designed to dig into the surface, and they've had some issues with it working well. But, but I think if it comes back out of winter, it'll still be asleep. It'll still be useful. Beagle 2 was a, a British uh, thing that landed and then failed to, to, to write back home. Um, I want to get to Mars 2020 here, which is the, the official name for Perseverance. Perseverance is the rover. So this is where Perseverance has landed right here. But we've visited a lot of places. We just haven't been to Ballas Marineris. And I think part of the problem there is we, it's just kind of dangerous to get there. And it hasn't been a top priority for the missions. But eventually we will get there. So next slide, please. So here's Mars Perseverance. Uh, it's Mars Perseverance. Uh, it landed, uh, landed 71 days ago, 71 Sol's uh, days. So that's Mars, Mars days <clears throat> and landed on February 18th and landed at a place called Octavia E. Butler landing area, which was named after the science fiction writer. And the actual main area where it landed is, is a place called Yuzero crater. So perseverance is uh, pretty big for a, for one of these landers. It's about the size of a car. You can see its its mass there, about 900 kilos, 2,000 pounds, so a good-sized car. <coughs> Excuse me. Ken showed you what the cameras do. It actually carries 23 camera systems, including the mass cam systems, plus a number of instruments to measure the atmosphere, the temperature, the, uh, it has an, a, a microphone to do sound. It can study the chemical composition of the rocks and the dust and the sand. And it's also collecting samples, which will then be picked up by another spacecraft later on. So I guess it's going to leave a little line of bags or something, I don't know, a little box, little line of boxes with rocks in them that somebody else will come and pick up. <coughs> so it's nuclear powered, um, uses uranium-238. I was kind of interested to see that that nuclear power plant will probably last longer than the spacecraft. 
nuclear. I think this, this has a half-life of about 87 years. Um, it can rove at about, about 0 0.1 miles per hour, so pretty slow. Uh, it's pretty rugged. It can go over most of the landforms that it sees there. And just a couple of weeks ago, it deployed the Ingenuity rover, which is, or the Ingenuity chopper, which is a tiny little chopper that um, we've been hearing about in the news. So if you actually want more information about the mast cams, I actually pulled up a web page. Before we go any farther, I'm going to put that in chat so that you have it. And then at the end of this, we also have some other we also have some other links that you can look at. So let's go to the next slide, please. So this is a map of the geologic units, the areas in Yezero Crater that we would certainly love to have the spacecraft study. Um, I don't know what the nominal mission is, probably 90 days. It'll probably go for years like every other one does. <clears throat> so it will be exploring what's called an ancient lake bed, a paleo lake. And it's also thought to have deposits of volcanic ash in it. Now, the reason that we want to study this is because it's a great place to explore for signs of ancient life, or maybe even if there's life there today. Um, and that's a big deal, is looking for if there was any kind of life on Mars. And it would tell us a lot more about the past of Mars. We know that it was warmer and wetter on Mars in the past, but and, and if it was, then it could have formed life. But how far did that life go? We don't really know. So we're looking for clues. Um, and right now, today, it's sort of a, a it's sort of a challenge for life to live there, but there are little microbes that could be there. So there, you can see from this map, there are, there's, a, there's a delta that was probably formed when there was a flood or something like that. And a lot of material got deposited onto the floor of the crater. There's a little uh, yellow line where you can see that, that the um, rover is supposed to go. It, they also want to look at what are, what are called ash and airfall deposits. It could be from volcanic e explosions and eruptions that took place far away, but they blew across the, the landscape and landed here. And then, you know, anywhere else that they can get it to go. But this is a pretty target-rich environment for them to look at. So there's a lot of science we could cover here, but since we're really talking about images, we should probably go straight to the pretty pictures. So let's go to the next slide. So the top image in this is MASTCAM's first 360 degree panorama, and it was composited with perseverance in the image. So image, the MASTCAM or one of the other cameras actually took pictures of the spacecraft and they composited that in. This was stitched together from 140 individual images and this were, these were taken on the third day, SOL 3, February 21st, 2021. Now, if you could zoom in on this image, you would see wind scoured rocks, you'd see small sand dunes around the area. The ridges in the, in the distance are part of the rim of Yezero Crater. And the closer ones are outcrops of the Delta. So the bottom image is a selfie that Perseverance took of itself with the Ingenuity chopper about a dozen feet away. You can see it off in the distance. There's tracks and it's in between the tracks. So it, it kind of dropped, it carried the, uh, it carried Ingenuity underneath its belly basically and then and then over a period of about two days, very slowly deposit it down onto the surface after it, had, it extended its legs. Hmm. Next slide, please. So let's go to the chopper for a minute. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, I'm sorry. So this is a, this is a panorama. It's actually much bigger than what I'm showing you here. And, and I, at the end, we'll give you a link where you can go get these images. This is a recalibrated image of the first mass cam image from Perseverance. It's actually a very large panorama. I've zoomed in on the center part. So what I want you to notice is there are small dunes in the close in the clo in the in the close distance. Um, those are formed around rocks that are scattered around. The rocks are kind of there's a lot of discussion going on about those rocks right now. They look like volcanic rocks to me, um, and I wanted to make sure that I looked at some of the latest images because. Sometimes the first images, the color's a little off and, and it might tell you something different about the rocks, but these kind of look like rocks that have, you know, either been brought there by water or the smaller ones could have been brought there and they're, they're kind of some kind of ash fall, something from a volcano. Um, the ridges in the, in the close foreground are part of that delta that I told you about that built up as water flowed through the region. The best thing we might understand about right now is that, that water probably flowed about a billion years ago or maybe longer. You can also see some rock layers in the outcrops at the middle left. And then in the distance, that part, that hill is part of the crater rim. So this is a 360 degree view. I encourage you to go to the, to the Perseverance site and look at the full images. But the color is basically calibrated as Ken talked about to show how it would look if you were standing there and exploring with your own eyes. Okay, next slide. 
So we've been hearing about the helicopter, and this is a really cute little helicopter. You could also call it a drone. Its name is Ingenuity, and you can see it's starting to spin up its little blades there. They tested that a couple of times before they actually had it fly. So this little guy weighs about 1.8 kilos, about four pounds. Its blades spin about five times faster than Earth helicopters. That's because it's operating in a very thin atmosphere. The atmosphere at Mars is about zero, about 1% of Earth's. Um, it's also in a lower gravity environment. Um, the chopper is programmed with uploaded computer code that tells it when to fly. And then the engineers in here on Earth can adjust that code for whatever conditions that it, that it in, encounters. And they're right now continually tweaking that code because they've, they've had some accidental shutoffs where the code has said, well, I don't like the conditions, so I won't fly. <clears throat> and then they re-upload as, as needed. So Oh yeah, I meant to tell you that the, the, the spinning rate is about 2400 RPM for those of you that want to know that. And it has a power source that is basically solar cells and they charge up the batteries. So the next slide, please. Here's MassCam's view of Ingenuity taking off and landing on its first flight. So this is not real time. Um, the first flight was 39.1 seconds and it went up about three meters, so about 10 feet, which is a big, uh, big achievement. Then it landed again. So it's kind of cute. So after the first flight, NASA announced that this they were going to name this region Wright Field after the Wright brothers because it was roughly 100 years after the Wright brothers flew. Now, the interesting thing about this, there's a little, little compartment on, on Ingenuity that holds a piece of cloth from the Kitty Hawk, which flew first, few, uh, first flew more than 100 years ago. All right, next slide, please. All right, so um, I'm not going to cover every flight. It's flown four times, but here's a brief bit of Ingenuity's second flight. This was taken with, um, is that actually flying or is that a still? It's rotating now. Oh, okay, good. So uh, this was taken with Mast Cam Z that we mentioned earlier. So I'm, I'm not seeing it fly. So, oh, there it goes. So it's just kind of hovering. Right. So it's kind of cool. While you're watching it hover, there's... Um, you can take a little little bit more detailed look of the the hill in the distance and then this river delta off to the to the, in the middle distance and then all the rocks so you can see this is a pretty desolate place there's nothing really uh <clears throat> if you grew up reading edgar rice burroughs this looks nothing like his mars <clears throat> next slide please so ingenuity actually oh wait a minute slide. i'm stuck there you go oh okay ingenuity has its own camera system uh, it's not, it doesn't have near the capabilities of mass cam, but it can send back images of the Martian surface that as it's exploring. And it's supposed to be sort of exploring ahead of, of perseverance. I don't think that was really originally what they planned, but now they're going to use it as a little scout to fly ahead of, of perseverance. So this is the first aerial image ever taken on Mars from an aircraft. And it was taken by Ingenuity. And you can kind of see its shadow down there in the bottom. You can also see the tracks that were made by perseverance as it was driving around. All right, next slide, please. So this is the third flight. Promise I'm not going to show every one of them. But for the videographers here, you'll notice very frustratingly it goes off screen. And mass cam doesn't pan along with it. So I was sitting there thinking, where's the pan? You know, somebody pulled the pan. Um, but that's a feature. It's not a bug. So it's flying around. The fastest that, that has flown has been just over 6.5 feet per second, although it might have gone a little faster yesterday. <clears throat> I don't know if that data is available yet. That's not its top speed. Um, the faster it goes, though, the less detailed its imaging will be. So they kind of have a trade-off between let's go really fast and let's get great images. On this flight, the chopper got up to a, uh, rose up to a height of about five meters, about 16 feet, and it was about 280 feet away from the rover. Is it going to come back? <laughs> one, one would hope so. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. Well, while we're comes. waiting for it, MassCam it can take. Um, I was looking up some data about mass cam and it can take high diff video at 10 frames per second. So it isn't always just a whole bunch of stills put together. It also does single exposure color snapshots. And that's kind of what we've been seeing. Ken already explained how that works. So interestingly, I was reading about this. The mass cam has electronics that will allow it to process images on its own without using the rover CPU. So it can do a little bit of like pre-processing. It has an internal data buffer that lets it store thousands of images and, and a few hours of high def video. And then they can send it back to Earth whenever. And somebody asked a question about that, which I'll get to in the Q&A. So the resolution for the resolution geeks, uh, the resolution for mass cam is 2.9 inches or 
7.4 centimeters per pixel at a distance of a kilometer. So that's pretty good. And it's about 150 microns per pixel. All right, so this slide that we're looking at, um, I'm sorry, I'm off. What is this? <laughs> uh, high uh, shot down from uh, the helicopter on its second flight, I think. Okay, I, oh, okay, all right. I'm not saying that the left picture. I must not have given you that slide. Darn. No, that was okay. just animated. Oh, there it is. Oh, that's that. right. I did that. Okay. <laughs> I forgot I animated it. I got fancy. So on the third flight, Ingenuity actually took a little panorama and took some pictures, and it managed to include pers Perseverance in its field of view. So everybody got busy, and they kind of cut Perseverance out. In the original image, it's kind of off there on the left. You can see that little bump. And then on the left, on, on the far left of this, you can see Perseverance, Perseverance sitting there. So another first this is the first image of a rover taken by an aircraft on another world which i think is kind of cool um so yesterday ingenuity did its fourth flight and it now has another month of flying time ahead of it and here's the panorama the original panorama that it um that it took all right so i want to talk just real quickly on this one slide about the images and what they look like coming down versus what we see <clears throat> after they get processed so they come back and they have to be calibrated for color and for other aspects using the data that's been returned. Um, and they have some, some palettes, color palettes that they like to apply to this. And Ken's told us how all the images are obtained. Once they're on the ground, the teams do some calibration so that the colors match. This one is about how it looks when it comes back. And I think there's been a little pipeline, what they call pipeline processing done, but the color palette hasn't been applied. So again, the features in the distance, you know, we see the tracks of perseverance in the middle, right, right close to us. There's the delta in the far distance. And then in the very far distance, there's the, uh, there is this, um, <clears throat> the room in the crater. Now there's been a little bit of geology talk about these and, and certainly no big analysis, but it looks like there's layered sandstone on those outcrops. So that might argue for the fact that there was a lot of water coming through here. Sandstone can also be layered by using the wind. So yeah, that's true, Jim, it is an alien ship. <laughs> so, um, but, but wind can also deposit rocks. So that, so, you know, the, the, the jury is out until they actually go and do the chemistry on these rocks, they won't know exactly what deposited them. But this is part of the area that the Rover will be exploring in the coming months. And then the next slide, please. So this is a, a little one. Um, Oh, I'm, oh, here we go. So this is a sneak peek at a couple of images at the SuperCam on Perseverance has been taken. That's another one of the cameras. These are raw images. There's been no processing, no calibrating. And I just sort of pulled them together to make what looks like a rock outcrop. But, and there's some amazing detail in these. Uh, you can also see a dust spot on the lens already, that little round thing in the left picture. Um, but these are like, um, this would be like if you're hiking in the Grand Canyon, really. This is how familiar this looks, but this is on Mars. So SuperCam is a laser enabled imaging system. It fires a laser at a rock target and then can use the imaging system to identify the chemical makeup of the rocks and the regolith, which is the soil of Mars. It can measure distances. It can do studies of those areas. Um, and it can go to, it can show us things that the rock rover or the chopper can't reach. And it does do color imaging. So there will be a color version of this released. And I'll just mention in passing that there's also something called a ChemCam on board, which is more aimed at studying the chemistry of these rocks. So that's kind of a look at the images from Perseverance. I'll turn this back over to Ken now, and he can talk a little bit more about the Hubble images. Okay, thank you, Carolyn. Um, we're gonna be, uh, uh, there's a thing in astronomy called data compression that we use sometimes when we need to get a large amount of data back uh, quickly and, and given uh, Karen, uh, Carolyn's eloquence here on Mars, which I was reluctant to cut off since it's all brand new and exciting to all of us. I think I'm gonna perform a little data compression on the Hubble portion here and try to go through these things relatively quickly, um, but do feel free to ask questions later or, or to go back at things. So basically I'm just showing you some of the highlights from the 31 years of, of Hubble operations here. This was uh, one of the more excited and unexpected events early on. In 1993, we got this images of a comet named Shoemaker-Levy 9, which was broken into 21 uh, separate pieces when we found it in 1993, uh, I guess it was. And uh, we were hope and people did orbit calculations and discovered, oh my, this is gonna crash into Jupiter in a year. 
So we uh, furiously uh, rigged up a program both on Hubble and every other observatory in the world to take a look. No one was quite sure what we would see. A lot of people said, you're not gonna see anything with Hubble, don't waste your, your effort, but people persevered and uh, went ahead and prepared for it and found out that, wow, indeed, yes, you saw huge Im impact signatures in visible light on the left of the screen. These, uh, I believe the diameter of this feature is like five Earth diameters across, just absolutely immense. immense. And as time went on, you could see the results of the wind shear at the high altitudes in Jupiter kind of smearing out these pictures. So it was a kind of cool. It was a way to dynamically sample the atmosphere circulation in Jupiter, you know, as if you were able to drop some colored dye in the atmosphere, but nature did it for us. We also looked on the right side of the screen here in ultraviolet light, where you see the structures are are somewhat different and uh, the structure is actually a bigger, you can see it had a bigger impact on the light emitted in the ultraviolet. I believe this dot on the top is probably a shadow uh, of the moon Io. Uh, quickly going out uh, further in our solar system and beyond on the left, uh, another picture of Jupiter where it's un uh, besmirched by the impact of SL9, um, moon down below coming over the limb. Here we've uh, blown up pictures over the years uh, of the great red spot. And I don't know what happened to the labeling here, but this is 1995, um, 2009 and later. And you'll see as you look at this, the spot is actually shrinking. Now this cloud feature has been on Jupiter since Galileo invented the telescope. And in our lifetimes, it has suddenly started shrinking. Nobody really knows why. Uh, we do think if it continues at its current rate, it could actually disappear in the next 30 years, which would be astonishing for a storm that has raged on Jupiter's, in Jupiter's atmosphere uh, you know, for more than 400 years. So uh, keep an eye on that. We're, we're monitoring Jupiter at least once a year with Hubble. Of course, other facilities are looking at it as well. And it's going to be very, very interesting to see what happens um, with that in future years. Uh, both Jupiter and Saturn in the lower left here have very bright active aurora. Um, the Saturn picture, you have nice color coding. The aurora is, is typically observed in ultraviolet light, similar to uh, Earth. You can see it in visible light, but it's brighter in UV light. Here's a detail on the lower left of the Jupiter aurora, and you have the this banded structure, but you also see these bright spots. And this is one of the, the triumphs, of, triumphs of predictive science where people have calculated the magnetic fields of the satellites and how they reconnected to the magnetic field around Jupiter and predicted that ionized plasma would be coming down and hitting the surface and causing it to glow. And indeed, exactly in the spot that these flux tubes are known to intersect with the surface of Jupiter, you have the bright spots. The really cool verification of the validation of, of the auroral science that people have been doing. On the right side, just a summary of how our view of the Pluto system is improved. Oops, why did do that? Uh, on the upper part, this is uh, ground based, best ground based image we had before Hubble. You can see Pluto and a little bit of indication of the largest moon, Sharn. And then by uh, 2012, after multiple observations, by Hubble, we had a much fuller characterization of the system Pluto and Sharon from the original images, and then four more moons uh, orbiting there. This was obtained both uh, to understand the Pluto system better, but also to search and map out the area before New Horizons went by, so it didn't fly into a moon or, an, or a, uh, a field of debris uh, on its passage through Pluto. So it's a good example of how one NASA spacecraft works with another to enhance the return uh, from both missions. These are some pretty pictures of Jupiter um, and Mars in June and July of 2018 when they were closest uh, to Earth. Uh, just a, a gorgeous um, representational image there of Saturn. And Mars doesn't look too spectacular in this image. And that turns out because at the time of closest approach, there was a huge, massive globe-wide dust storm going on. So you know, all the detail got completely smeared out, which is you know, very disappointing to people interested in 
studying the surface features, but uh, kind of interesting for those who did atmospheric studies. So you disappoint one group, you excite another group, and uh, you, know, you just flow with it and see what you get at a different time. Formal Hall B was one of the earliest systems where uh, we thought maybe we had directly imaged a planet in a debris disk around a star. This black area has been blocked out by a coronagraph, a, a piece of metal that's put in front of the camera to dim out the central star so you can see the dim light around it, which is like eight orders of magnitude dimmer than what the star puts out. So this spot here observed it over a couple of different years and saw it move. So there's something definitely in orbit around there. And originally it was identified as a planet. There has been continual controversy over the years since 2006 about it, whether it's really a planet or some kind of uh, collapsing cloud or whatever. So I would say that there is probably not complete agreement that this particular image is, is of a planet, um, but it's a cool, interesting figure. And it's certainly one way that planets will be imaged in the future. We have also been able to study in a few cases where the geometry is just right, the atmosphere of planets around other stars. Here you have Hubble looking toward a bright star, planet in between, the light from the star goes through the rim of the atmosphere on both sides of the planet, gets to the object. And when you look at the starlight, there is a depression. This is intensity of light vertically versus color. And you see there are these dips where the light goes away and that's methane in the atmosphere of the planet absorbing the light from the star. So we actually know something about the chemical composition of an atmosphere of a planet around another star. A really cool thing given how far away and how small uh, these objects are. This I wanted to put in as an example of one of the best, it's the second largest, I believe, mosaic image composed of more than 100 separate images of something called the Carina Nebula. And it is a area where stars and planetary systems are being formed, coming together. A lot of the dark nodules here are where planets are in the process of formation. This is one of those images that you should get uh, off the web link that we'll have at the end where you can fly into it. And it's just instead of turning into pixels, there's just more detail and more detail and more detail. This one image contains perhaps something like five of the most iconic images Hubble's ever done. One of them I'll zoom in on this area over here called Mystic Mountain, um, but it's just incredibly rich. And this is available for download if you wanna create your own wall size poster. We won't print it for you, but we'll give you the data to send out to your, your favorite printer. Um, so this, I, I guess, is Mystic Mountain. Uh, it's shown in two different colors. So it shows why we want to observe objects in different colors. This is visible light like the eye would see, uh, very active, very dense area of star formation. You see some jets coming out here in a shock. This is where a star system is forming, uh, very active. You see another jet coming out here. Um, and uh, again, uh, an image that you could lose yourself in for hours. We also have looked at this in infrared light and we like to do that because uh, infrared light gets through dust much more efficiently. So you can see, we can actually see through the nebula and see background stars. We can also see some stars inside the nebula and help map out the three-dimensional structure of the object. This is another object inside the Carina uh, mosaic that I showed. It's called Eta Carina. It's a star that is probably gonna go supernova any day. I mean, that's we, we, we keep hoping that during our individual careers, we'll see this happen. But in the meantime, it's very unstable. There's a, a star at the center that's throwing out these huge spheres uh, of ejecta when it has these minor um, eruptions. And then there's stuff coming out along the plane, the orbital plane of the uh, stellar system there as well. This is a, another uh, object called the Cat's Eye Nebula. This is an object that probably won't supernova, but is uh, doing some more minor explosion called Nova. Uh, these are explosions that happen regularly. In this case, I think about every 1500 years. And you see, it's not as simple as one might think. It's not just one tiny sphere at the center and then an older one that's out further and then an older one that's even out further than that. There are all these bizarre shapes. This inner one is an elongated, brightest in blue light. 
hotter material. There's an offset ellipse here, which is not even centered on the star. Another one here with this really odd bubble. And then there's jets coming out top and bottom. So this is a nightmare scenario for people who are trying to model this, who would like to, as we say in physics, assume a spherical cow when trying to, to model a cow. Here we would like to uh, assume spherical, uh, spherically symmetric ejections, but nature is not so kind and makes it extremely complicated. So, you know, we're likely to say in these situations, it's all about magnetic fields because they tend to be what produces these very complicated structures. Uh, here are two images of what are called globular structure, uh, globular clusters, very dense balls of, of stars. Uh, this Hubble is about the only instrument that can actually resolve into the core and separate them. Uh, this object here has uh, a bunch of what are called blue straggler stars, many more young stars that are expected that must be uh, forming newly and, and can't possibly be left over from the origin of the cluster itself. And then down below, uh, a different cluster where we've zoomed in all the way to the core. And this is a very nice image for showing the variety of colors of the stars here. These bright blue objects you see are probably the youngest stars in the center of the cluster. The red ones are cooler, um, they're more dominant in red light. Um, and our older stars uh, that are still very bright, but in the process of slowly fading away. Some of those might explode in nova or supernova. Some will just fade out and become rather dim white dwarfs. On that last image, by the way, I should go back here. The resolution and the multiple observations that we have, uh, we've actually been able to map the motions of 100,000 different stars in the center of that cluster and actually directly study the dynamics and how they orbit around each other uh, over the years. This is a very famous object, the Messier 51, object number 51 in the Messier catalog of galaxies, a uh, nice spiral galaxy. These arms coming out from the center. There's a secondary galaxy here that's in a minor collision with, um, it's also called the Whirlpool galaxy for obvious reasons. Here's uh, where a collision hasn't gone quite so smoothly and elegantly. It's uh, at least two, maybe more objects crashing together uh, distorting each other and setting off new star formations. So these bright regions, uh, bright red light especially, is where new stars are forming because material came together from the collision and set off a new wave, made things dense enough so a new wave of star formation could actually happen. Hubble's also found, when it shortly after launch actually, found the first evidence that massive black holes occur near the center of galaxies. Uh, here's the, the galaxy itself. This red rectangle shows where we put uh, one of the instrument fields view, a spectrograph that separated the light from the uh, object into different colors. The object is here. As you go toward the bottom of the picture, the light gets shifted out to the red, which means the material is rotating away from us at very high speed. When you go above, it goes to the blue, which means the object the material is coming toward us. So this thing is rotating. Uh, sort of head over tail, head over feet uh, very, very quickly. And the only way it can move that fast, that close into the center of the galaxy is if there's a huge amount of mass there and that can only be done if there's a black hole there. So that's how black holes went from theory to observationally confirmed um, phenomena. Hubble also uh, did this experiment called the ultra deep field. And the idea here was to take the telescope, point it at an area of the sky that it was as blank as possible and stare at it for 11 days. Now you can imagine that there were a lot of people in the community that were screaming bloody murder. What, you're gonna waste 11 days of telescope time looking at nothing, you are insane. So there was huge arguments about it. The director of the Space Telescope Science Institute finally said, look, we're gonna do this, it's gonna be worth it. Um, and that's why I get director's discretionary time. So um, we did it. And when we got the image back, um, found that it wasn't really blank at all, as long as you looked faint enough and far enough back in time, especially as we added additional observations in later years, including observations in the infrared and ultraviolet. In the end, we found something like 10,000 stars in this one small area of the sky that's about a fifth the size of the full moon. So if you take this image, 
realize that every galaxy here, these are all galaxies for the most part, almost no stars are visible, except there's a star there, but almost everything else is a galaxy of maybe 100 or 200 billion stars. Multiply that by 10,000 galaxies in this image, multiply by the whole area of the sky, and you discover that there are more stars in the universe than all the greens of sand and all the beaches of the world. That's the best analogy we've been able to come up with, but just an incredible richness of stars and planetary systems, since we now know that most stellar systems have planets um, in them. So a, a huge uh, set of possible habitats for life and intelligence out there. Uh, it's a very big universe and a very varied universe. Another uh, interesting thing that was not thought of before launch with Hubble is uh, something called gravitational lensing, which has allowed us to look even further back in time to fainter objects than Hubble would ordinarily be able to see. In this region here, there's a very dense cluster of galaxies with very strong gravitational field, which can amplify and focus the light from objects behind it. And when it does that, you see these curved arcs those are actually distorted images of objects that are behind the galaxy way out toward the edge, toward the beginning of time and the edge of the universe. These are some panels that show it expanded. If you model the mass concentration in this cluster, you can put this light back together into an undistorted image. So this allowed us, has allowed us to go back to almost 400 million years after the Big Bang, which is far better than we had expected to do. Actually, here's a a graphic that talks about that. In 1990, uh, this is uh, represents ground-based observations. Uh, we're going from left to right, how far back we're looking. Present time is over here. Uh, we go back here about uh, 6 billion years after the Big Bang, after the initial expansion of the universe, we could see back to about that point. So about half the lifetime um, of the universe was visible from the ground. The original Hubble Deep Field in 1995 took us back to uh, only about 100, uh, only to 1.5 billion years after the Big Bang, so a huge leap. Then the Ultra Deep Field, where we added the ultraviolet, took us back to 800 million years after the Big Bang, and adding in the IR to the Deep Field brought us back to about 480 million years. So we're, we can only get back that far in the areas where we see lensing occurring, but we still exceeded our, our biggest expectations in terms of how back, how far back in time, how close to the origin of the universe we'd be able to see with Hubble. The James Webb Space Telescope, which is supposed to launch in October, is designed to be able to do that in all directions on the sky, not just in directions where we happen to have a gravitational lens. And we also think it'll get back to about 200 million years after the Big Bang. And we hope that will be far enough back to see what we call first light. The universe in the first part of its existence after the expansion, after the explosion was dark. And it took a while for matter to come together to force form stars and galaxies to light up so that we could see it. So we're searching, one of the things we're searching for with Webb is the first light. When did stars turn on? And we think it's somewhere in this vicinity and we hope that Webb is big enough and sensitive enough to actually see that first light. Okay, we wanted to take, uh, if we may, Bill, I know we're running a little late, just very briefly talk about cultural impact of uh, the Mars observations and Hubble. This can be pretty quick, uh, but I'll turn this, the Mars part over to Carol here. Yeah, um, and, and this is really just kind of a quick, look through history we as i said earlier we've been interested in mars for a long time and it really goes back to prehistoric times but people's first view of the red dot was just they assigned a mystical meaning to it and that's where we get you know mars the god of war uh next slide please but eventually and and i'm skipping over a ton of history here thousands of years but we began observing mars and trying to figure out what it was so you know we have people with telescopes looking at it and that really, really did pick up as, as the telescope race took on, in, you know, in the 1700s and 1800s. Um, in, late, in, the, in the late 1800s, there was a fellow named Percival Lowell who built an observatory in Arizona, and he really wanted to study Mars with it. And he was also really taken with the idea that Martians existed. Next slide, please. So he got the idea for that from a fellow named Giovanni Schiaparelli, who was an Italian observer 
who observed that Mar who observed Mars and he wrote about his findings in Italian, noting that he thought he saw some markings that he called canali. And that got mistranslated to the word channels. And Lowell and a number of other people just jumped to the conclusion that, oh, that means canals. And those are only built by um, Italian, an, Italian, an intelligent race of beings that lived on the surface of Mars. So Lowell wrote, wrote a lot about this. You can go find his books in the library. Um, it, it, there's a sort of a, you know, an interior of one of his books began to focus on the idea of Mars. And, and I have a couple of his books and he has these very logical reasons why he thinks that Mars existed there. But that really caught the idea, next slide, of more than just the astronomers. It also caught the idea of uh, people's imaginations and that those were fired by science fiction writers. So those of you who grew up reading science fiction, you know, we had the greats like Edgar Rice Burroughs and Heinlein. Those stories about Mars really took off and brought people, brought attention to, to, to the planet in a way that maybe astronomy didn't. Um, you remember, uh, next slide please, the H.G. Uh, Wells with the War of the Worlds. People probably have heard that radio play a number of times. It's been made into a movie. So there's continual interest in the sort of the fantastic ideas about Mars. Um, and this romantic idea about of an inhabited Mars where there were princesses and, you know, whatever else really kind of started to go away in the, in the 60s when we were seeing much better telescopic views. Um, so this idea of an inhabited Mars with its spaceships, with its own civilization, kind of went around and, you know, went away, started to go away as we got better and better pictures. So this is the reality of the Mars that we know about. No princesses, no monsters. Next slide, please. I'm sorry, we're, we need to go to the next slide. Yeah, just a dry and dusty kind of desert planet with a lot of canyons on it and volcanoes. But there's still a Mars mania out there that... Um, that is not anymore about science fiction. Uh, next slide, please. Um, there's a future on Mars that's going to include inhabitants. And here's sort of an artist's concept of what a spaceship is going to look like going from Earth to Mars. And the first Martians will be on their way probably in the next decade, and there'll be people born here on planet Earth. They're, they may have that science fiction interest in it. They'll have the science interest, but, but they're going to have a reality of Mars that, that we're we able to give them now because we have perseverance and we have curiosity and all the other missions that have gone there to show us what it's really like. Next slide, please. Um, certainly there's interest among the U.S., Europe, China, and the Russians for going to Mars. India wants to go to Mars. Uh, the aim has been to do international co collaborations to get there, if for no reason that it's a lot cheaper to share the cost out to everybody else. Um, and Elon wants to go. So here's a picture of Elon Musk and his purported Mars city. He's been publicizing those plans to get there within the decade. At first, he wanted to send along a whole lot of married couples. Um, I'm not sure what his plans are right now, but he wants to go to Mars and he wants to build a city there. He wants to have thousands and thousands and thousands of people there in the next few decades. Next slide, please. I think the reality is going to be more like, you know, it's going to take a while for us to really get there. I had a friend named Jesko von Puttkammer who worked for NASA for many years, and he put it best when he told a bunch of us, we were at a Case for Mars meeting and we're having a beer, um, that he felt that Mars was an expo the exploration of Mars was a metaphor for the future of the human race. And it is very true. I mean, that is where we're going to go. We're going to have people there. They will be the first Martians. And that kind of goes after Ray Bradbury's approach in his landmark book about Mars called The Martian Chronicles. At the very end, there's a family sitting at the edge of a canal on Mars, and the father tells his children, we are the Martians. And I think, you know, we're already the Martians in our minds. Uh, we just haven't sent our bodies there yet. That's going to be our kids and our grandkids, really. Next slide. <clears throat> Okay, now shifting gears after that weighty concept there, uh, philosophical. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll Sorry about that. No, that's okay. It's good stuff. Uh, this is just to show the influence impact that Hubble has had on popular culture. And this is just a small sampling, uh, which I think is the one that's missing Carolyn's book. So we need to add that in before the next talk. Uh, but you can see there's lots of, of, lots of coffee table type books, a lot of technical type books. It's just all over the place and uh, magazines, newspapers, uh, whatever. And in terms of textbook, I think it's fair to say that almost every single page of every modern astronomy textbook has been rewritten by the results from Hubble, no matter what the topic is, whether it's close in, in our own solar system or out on the edges uh, of the universe at the beginning of time. Uh, Hubble has, has an impact and has improved our understanding uh, of, of those objects. 
Uh, Hubble's been uh, given homage on postage stamps on the Google Doodle. Uh, U-Haul has a habit of um, paying homage to big things happening in their state. Uh, and here, the a lot of the Maryland U-Haul trucks uh, have Hubble on the side of them. And I actually just ran across this in a random parking lot. I wasn't uh, specifically doing anything for Hubble, but I managed to, to get a shot of it. Um, and it's kind of cool to see something you're working on show up in a scenario like that. And then, of course, you, there's the silly aspect of thing. We're also known as the Hubble bubble chewing gum, which is, you know, a little bit less uh, exciting. <laughs> but we're there. Um, I think Carolyn mentioned earlier, we've talked about uh, the intersection with art. And, and certainly this is one place uh, where you see it greatly, uh, especially after 31 years of observations, um, a lot of people have appreciated uh, Hubble images purely for the art they represent over and above, uh, and above the science. And here you see a, a display that occurred in the Baltimore Museum of Art uh, and amongst their uh, classical art, a model of Hubble, and then three of the images printed inside these classic looking arches. Um, showing that. And I'm personally actually very interested in the intersection of art and science and try to uh, participate where possible and give talks on, on the subjects. I think it's it's a way to bring together two radically different communities, the, the artists and the scientists and the people who appreciate both um, and increase the understanding and appreciation of the universe by uh, both groups. And along the same lines, uh, I have a European colleague who's even more so into this, who helped to organize in collaboration with the European Space Agency, a large exhibit back in the uh, spring of 2017. It was in the Palazzo Cavalli Franchetti in Venice, one of the very old palaces there. So it's a, it's a really interesting collection of, of modern uh, and, and older times. Here's just a couple of shots from it. So this is the the palace uh, Franchetti right here. If you look close, you can actually see some banners advertising our place in space. So it's right on the Grand Canal in Venice, uh, absolutely lovely location for it. And the concept behind this exhibit is that we sent out a call to artists all over Italy saying, we're gonna have something like 10 rooms in the palace with Hubble imagery or artifacts displayed tell us what you would put in one or more of those rooms. And we had a competition, got something like two or 300 applications and selected the best uh, 10 or, or 12 out of those to show the art, you know, the, basically getting the artistic interpretation of whatever's in that particular room. So that's the entryway in the, uh, the, the palace before you uh, go by the Hubble of model. The entry, uh, stop that. Okay, the lower left here shows uh, artists interpreting the voyage you're about to go on as a skeletal gondola, sort of incorporating the uh, fact that we're in Venice along with a, a voyage through space. Uh, the next room in the lower right here uh, showing different planets and this artist did a, a bunch of tile covered uh, spheres and, and oblate spheroids. Uh, there was a room that had uh, solar arrays and images from the servicing missions of Hubble. Uh, artists made this construct that uh, looks like a ship. And it turned out if you look through the, the bay at the back here toward the front, there was a video going on inside showing the servicing missions. Uh, there was other art on, on the far walls. This room in the upper right uh, was showing the surfaces of, of both uh, inhabitable and, and uh, planets that were devoid of life. Uh, this one's showing the, the planetary surface that's uh, inhospitable to life on the image to the, the left here that I didn't include. It was uh, showing a, a green verdant uh, planet, um, basically in conjunction with, with Hubble imagery. On the lower left here, you see we had a room full of galaxy images and collisions and the artist chose to interpret it with these plaster, plastic uh, castings and, and sculptures. And then the final room of the exhibit, uh, there was more than this, I'm just sampling it, uh, had the Hubble deep fields in a surround vision and then these acrylic boxes with sort of blobs in them that it looked and were supposed to look like uh, uh, brains, uh, human and brains. And the idea was to symbolize uh, in an artistic fashion uh, life 
becoming self-aware, uh, the universe becoming alive through humanity and contemplating uh, its own existence. So that's the deep philosophical bent here to match Carolyn's last slide. But of course, some of us couldn't resist when looking at this, uh, explaining to people that, well, yeah, that's just the poor, the, the brains of the poor grad students that didn't make it through to their, to their PhD. That's where they ended up. Not, not really, I, at least I don't think. Uh, to be a little bit lighter, I just wanted to uh, do a nod to the uh, interaction over the years and symbiotic relationship that Star Trek has had with NASA and Hubble specifically uh, for more than 50 years, kind of feeding off each other, uh, the sci-fi writers and special effects artists. This is Rick Sternbach, who's done a lot of modeling and special effects work over many of the, the Star Trek series, um, talking about what he called inventing the future together, which I thought was, was marvelous. You know, they would come in, uh, he, he would visit NASA, find out what we're doing, try to extrapolate that to the future. We in turn would watch one of the shows and say, oh, that's pretty cool. I wonder if we can do anything like that. And we sort of both egg each other um, this way. And that uh, informal collaboration continues to this day. And it's just a, uh, a wonderful example of the interaction of, of art and science of, of fiction and, and, and reality. Okay, so after 31 years, we just had our 31st anniversary on April 24th of this year in five servicing mission, the adventure with Hubble continues. This is in fact the 31st anniversary image that was just released, so hot off the press. Uh, it's an object called AG Carina, uh, a hypergiant star that uh, has been throwing off layers of material for years, and this is another image if you were to, if you can get it off the, the website that we'll show you in a moment, where you can fly into it and just look at all sorts of deal uh, of detail. I've blown it up a little bit here so you can see all these blobs uh, here, which turn out to be dust, um, but also the uh, spot where the starlight collides with the surrounding gas. One thing I have not been able to find out, and I've asked a bunch of people, is how in the world do we get this rectangular shape? Uh, that's been cleared out by the, the wind coming off the star. There are other objects in the universe like this. I remember something called the red rectangle. So there is some kind of weird physics that allows that. But um, in the couple of days after seeing this image, I haven't been able to track down what people think the best theory is for that. So I'm going to admit right up front here that I don't know how you create a rectangular void around a star rather than a spherical one, uh, but it sure does get the imagination going. Um, and then you can see the outer layers were different temperature material, different elements. Uh, the red areas are more gas, the blue areas here, um, more dust. So in conclusion, uh, I think this image kind of puts everything together nicely. It's, this is from a space shuttle flight from I think the last Hubble servicing mission. And you can see part of Hubble through this window out here. And here is a replica. They wouldn't let us take the original, but a replica of Galileo's uh, telescope. I think it is from the museum in Florence, um, which astronaut, I think it was John Grunsfeld, uh, brought up and you know, uh, wanted to try to encapsulate the history of modern uh, telescopic astronomy, at least in one shot. So that's, a, I think, a really cool way of looking at you know, how far we've come in the last 400 years and begin to wonder, you know, how far are we going to go uh, going forward and what's next? And here I'm going to be a tease saying, if you want to find out what's going to be next, we're out of time, so you're going to have to invite us back. And I will close here with uh, this uh, page of references uh, on the top here, uh, a bunch of uh, links to Loch Ness Productions, which is Carolyn's uh, production company, and a link to her uh, writing uh, science writers page, uh, link to the books, uh, links to the Mars sites at NASA. Uh, here's my uh, own website if you want to find out more about what I do. And then, of course, the Hubble master site where you can go in. You can download most of these images from there, uh, get way more information on how Hubble works and has operated over the years. Uh, and there's a lot of stuff from the 30th anniversary last year. Um, that I think it would be fun to go back and see. Anyways, I'm going to stop there and we can take some question and answer, or hopefully give you some answers. We'll take questions at least. All right, thank you.
need to uh, go to stop share. There you go. Well, I tell you, I'm humbled uh, watching that. Uh, you know, the, it's, it's just mind boggling to me to think about how you folks figure out what you figure out. And I hope you're just not making it all up as you go along. <laughs> I wanted to we'll ask never you, tell. <laughs> I wanted to ask you two questions. One is, do you have any pictures of the Mutara Nebula? And what's up there in Europa that you're not showing us? <laughs> well, you know, we're not tried allowed to, to tell you. Yeah, we're not we, we've, to tell you. <laughs> we've tried to find out about Europa, but we have that uh, edict that says, you know, all these worlds are ours except one attempt no landings on Europa. So I don't, I don't know. I think, you know, we've got some plans to go there, but I, I worry about what's going to happen. Arthur C. Clarke is, you know, usually pretty smart about such things. All right. There was a question here that uh, somebody sent to uh, me to ask you. Did you either of you ever work at the shuttle crews in the training program at the NASA Water Training Center in Texas? If so, any good stories? I have not personally worked there, but um, in Hubble, we have what's called a, a project science office, which right now has four uh, scientists like myself who help to, to guide the, the uh, running of the program, the development and operations of the telescope. And the uh, senior project scientist who's the person who gets stuck with all the uh, interaction with NASA headquarters and, and, and the like, uh, did actually manage to connive her way down to Johnson Space Center in the water tank. And she is scuba qualified. So she actually mm. somehow talked her way into the tank and went in and, and uh, played with the astronauts. With There's a, inside the, the water, the, the huge pool at Johnson, there is a full-size model of Hubble uh, in the water. And the idea is, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, is you go in, put on a, a diving suit that kind of looks like a space suit, put on enough weight so you're kind of neutral. You don't float up, you don't go down to the bottom of the pool. So they call it the neutral buoyancy lab. And it's the nearest thing that you can do to get the feeling of what it's like to operate and move in space. So the idea is you put this on and then you go and you work with the model. You try taking an instrument out, putting an instrument in, you try opening a door, closing a door and just get used to what it's like to do those kind of things in zero G. You play with, you know, moving this fairly massive, uh, you know, like 300 pound instruments out, out of a, a container and putting it in the Hubble and realizing that, yeah, you know, and in this neutral buoyancy situation in space, you can move these massive things, but they still have momentum. So you gotta be really careful that you don't build up too much speed or you know you can't stop it and it goes crashing into the telescope and you know probably there goes your career as an astronaut. So uh, <laughs> it's, a, yeah, uh, it's a, a very critical tool that uh, astronauts have used all the time and certainly for all the servicing missions. Um, so anyways, yeah, I actually was down there uh, once on a tour and John Grunsfeld gave us a tour of the neutral buoyancy tank area. And this was before, I forget which mission it was, but he was showing me that he had to remove a hundred some odd screws uh, to a radiator or something like that. And you know, with the tools he had to use and he's using this big you know, glove and he was training to do that underwater too. So that was kind of interesting, but yeah, it's a huge pool. I think it's a couple stories. Yeah, I think that, that, that mm -hmm. the uh, 100 plus screws you're talking about was actually to repair the STIS instrument in one of the yeah, later yeah, you're missions. Right. Yeah, yeah. Generally, we would, the Hubble was designed so you, it was modular. So if you wanted to put a new instrument, you took out an old one, put a new one in, made a few connections, and it was simple and straightforward. When we got to the last servicing mission, we could only afford to put in two new instruments, but we had two others that had failed. So we uh, engineers went to work and came up with a way to actually repair it in space in, in the shuttle, which it was not designed to do. But for one of those, we had to get inside what was called the STIS instrument, Space yeah, Telescope yeah. Imaging Spectrograph. And it's, it's basically a, a old style telephone booth, refrigerator size is a good way to look at it. And we had to take a metal panel off the side so we could get in and do the report, repairs. Well, that panel had, I think 114 Something like that, yeah. Around yeah. the perimeter. You say, why in the world? Well, that's because it had to withstand launch loads, the vibrations mm -hmm. that happened during the original launch. Uh, you know, it wasn't designed to be opened in space. And in fact, when we did repair it successfully after a very long story, um, when we put a new cover on, we just put like, I don't know, 
five or ten screws or something because yeah. you know you didn't have to worry about it going them. through yeah. launch. But the uh, yeah, that it's it's funny with that hundred plus screws. That's what we all worried about. You know, you're never going to get a hundred screws to come off without something getting jammed. I mean, we're all used to you know working in a car or something in the house where something's rusted out and, and, and gotten stuck. Um, so we spent endless time simulating that in the water tank, doing it, you know, with, uh, in the high fidelity mechanical simulator at Goddard. Um, and in fact, that went smoothly. We had specialized tools. We had a special plate we put over it to capture all the screws mm -hmm. when we took them out so it didn't go floating away and get inside the telescope and scratch or I think John was determined to prove you all wrong too I mean so he John's did that, pretty driven <laughs> yeah. it turned out that that was not a problem at all but before we could get to that plate there was we had to remove a large orange oh yeah hand, yellow handle it's a, basically a mm -hmm. bar like a grab bar in a shower uh, the tube like this and then four mount points on the corner it had four massive screws on the end. It's like nobody worried about those. I mean, those are big, strong. They're not going to get stuck or, you know, we'll just go in there. And we got three of those screws out. Fourth one wouldn't move. Started stripping. I think it's all nervous. Like, okay, we're going to be dead in the water before we even start. You know, we're not even going to get the cover off. Never mind, you know, attack the hundred screws or worry about replacing the integrated circuit board or, or whatever. So the engineers on the ground, uh, at Goddard, where I work, got together and started uh, brainstorming. I thought, well, maybe an astronaut can just pull off the remaining one. We haven't tried it, so let's go back in the lab and try it. So they went there and they got one of these devices that measures the, the amount of uh, force that you're pulling, a, so strung it out, attached it to a model of this thing and revved it up and to find out how much force was required uh, to pull it off. And when they did that, they discovered, yeah, the uh, number the amount of force required is something an astronaut could generate. So we could tell them they could do that. What they didn't tell the astronauts right away is when they did that, they ratcheted it up and maybe hadn't thought this through, but this thing is on a, a long lever arm because they weren't just oh, holding it and pulling it. This thing snapped off. The piece went rip roaring past the head of the engineer and embedded itself in the ceiling, which you know is, is not the kind of environment you want to put astronauts in space where they have to preserve the integrity of space suits and whatever. So when they told the astronauts, yes, it's possible, Johnson, you can have the guy do this, but we suggest you have the astronaut hold the thing with his, own, his or her own hand. Don't use any levers or strings or ropes that you're going to lose control of. So Mike Massimino ended up being the person tasked oh, right. yeah. with this yeah. and he grabbed it and you know, just with all, you know, after years of practice and study and elegance and careful calibrations, of how much force to use, he just went in there like a Neanderthal and just ripped the thing off and got it off. Uh, and then Franz Feld went in and did the, uh, the, the fine work on the, the screws, took off the plate, took out a circuit board, put in a new circuit board, put on this cover with just a handful of screws and brought this instrument uh, back to life, which had originally two different electronic sides, both of which had failed uh, by the time we got to the last servicing mission. We only could get to one side to repair. So we did that and that one, one repaired side has now lasted longer than the two original sides. So we're operating, we repaired another instrument called the advanced camera for surveys. Both of them have now gone longer on the repair side. So apparently we know what we're doing uh, in repairing the instruments if we're not quite sure how to get the container apart makes me think you should have set up a can of wd-40 <laughs> yeah but contamination by a bill yeah i, mean, I know uh, but that joke was the... going around yeah <laughs> Another question here: how long does it take images to return to earth and how long to send programming information i believe that was oh oh i got that one i got that one <laughs> <laughs> well from mars it's um it kind of depends on where the where the planet is in its orbit, but it's anywhere between five and twenty minutes on a one way trip. The uh, data rate the data rate is about two megabits per second uh, to get up to the from the rover to the orbiters, and then the orbiters have their own data rate that it goes at. So some of the time, yeah, you know, it's I think the stuff is stored on on the rover first, and then yeah, we get yeah. a good good line of sight to the orbiter it goes to the orbiter and then the orbiter yeah. has to wait for a good line of sight to earth so things aren't always as fast uh, you know as the light travel time yeah and i think there's the more than one orbiter earth. right that they're using uh yeah I think they're, re they're relaying through maven and and mro and maybe mars orbiter i don't remember all of them we're, we're in general you know 
way far behind the Arthur C. Clarke's view of where we'd be in the in the 2000s yeah. in terms of fleets of things around and orbiting space stations. But parts of his vision actually have come true. And mm -hmm. having this mini fleet in orbit on Mars and multiple rovers on the planet, I think, you know, is kind of cool. And it's, uh, you know, maybe a little slower time scale than he, than he was envisioning, but it's uh, getting to the point that uh, we have stuff out there continuously and, you know, maybe able to witness any anomalies like in 2001, the signal that goes off from the monolith. And well, I think even... what's cool for me is I'll, I'll log in every day and there's a new image and it's kind of like, like having a webcam on Mars, although not quite as immediate as a webcam, but we have this ability to be able to log in, go to the Mars site and there's a new picture or pictures or a video or something like that. It's still boggles my mind. It's just kind of fun as we were preparing the talks, like, hey, Carolyn, there's another picture. It's like, hey, when do we stop? <laughs> there's another video, yeah. And I think the video from yesterday's flight is going to be available today. So. There's another question here. How much longer does NASA think Hubble will be able to perform its mission? Hmm, good one. Um, in the end, it's controlled by how long the hardware lasts, pretty much. But our view is that we think we can last uh, through the end of the decade and, and maybe even beyond. So that's the, the kind of goal. We are doing what we can to uh, modify our operations uh, to preserve the life of things. Like if you have a, a mechanism like a filter wheel that you're turning and it has a limited number of turns in its lifetime, you try to operate it in a way that doesn't have excessive turns in it, you know, to group your observations so that when you go to this position, you kind of hang around there for a while, take a bunch of data. You don't go take a picture at this position, then rotate the wheel here and use a different filter, <laughs> then rotate here, you know, because that just wears it out faster than it has to be. We're not at a position yet where we have to be ultra conservative that way, but things that don't hurt the science return too badly and make sense like that, we are doing. So we, we actually have these, what are called LEIs, life extension initiatives and maybe 30 of these things that are, are set up uh, either in use now or ready to be put in use when we lose one component or another. We've also developed procedures for changing like electronic sides on the instruments for where we have redundancy. Instead of being down for a month while we switch things up, we have procedures now that we've put in the can ready to go that would allow us to switch to the backup sides more rapidly. We even have now one of the expendables on Hubble that often controls how long we can go is the gyroscopes, which control the oh, yeah. pointing. Yeah. And um, normally you, you wanna operate with three. We had six, we've had three failures already of the remaining three, one of them is a little flaky. So we're getting nervous, but have no fear. The engineers have found ways to operate on two gyros or one gyro in combination with things like sun sensors and magnetometers, which were in low Earth orbit. So you can use the Earth's magnetic field as a reference. So in fact, after we define the two gyro and one gyro modes, we've discovered we get almost as good results with one gyro as with two. So when we lose the third gyro, we'll probably immediately go to one gyro mode to help extend the life a little bit further. Um, we can't Despite rumors, we can't do any zero gyro observations, but it's pretty spectacular that they think they can point and control the pointing of the telescope enough to do uh, to operate on single gyros. There'll be a few things we can't do, like track really fast moving objects on the sky in one gyro mode, but we'll still be able to do 90 or 95 percent of the. the and another ice. one here: Did you overlap with astronaut Story Musgrave, who tweaked a telescope in '93, I think? Indeed, yes. And uh, Story, <laughs> whoever asked that question, uh, must must know something about Story. He's a, a very, shall we say, colorful character um, and uh, a lot of fun to work with. I uh, didn't have close contact with him during the mission. I mean, certainly we saw all of the astronauts at one time or another, but for the 25th anniversary of Hubble, uh, I had helped to uh, uh, organize uh, at Griffith Observatory in LA, a four day weekend celebration that included uh, a bunch of us talking about, you know, like we did here, but also talking about servicing missions. We brought in a, a <coughs> current uh, astronaut in training to talk on the first day. And then we wanted to get somebody who had worked on Hubble, but we were told we weren't allowed to steal anybody 
on that Saturday because they all had to be at the Air and Space Museum for the big event there. Um, so we hunted around trying to find a way around this and it turned out there were five astronauts who had said they couldn't be in Washington and folks told us if we could get them, you know, for like Sunday or Monday, it wouldn't be considered interference with the event. And it turned out Story had some kind of uh, business in LA and he was willing to come out and do something at, at Griffith, uh, you know, at relatively modest cost because he was coming out there there anyways. And we thought, well, he's perfect, except, oh, wait a minute. When, when Story comes, you don't know what he's going to say. I mean, he's, <laughs> he's literally a, 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 yeah. a loose cannon. Um, but we, you know, we talked to people and to him, he's like, oh, let, let's give it a try. I mean, you know, we got a family audience here. We'll have to tell, try to tell him that uh, and make sure he behaves. Um, so we brought him in, I think, on that Sunday when we were talking about future missions. And he, he gave a great presentation, but he's one of these astronauts that, you know, is like on nine PhDs and has got multiple careers. Like, you know, he started out as a brain surgeon. So he opens his talk when he's talking about that and he's talking about doing that. I said, that's okay, fine. But then he starts showing pictures of people, you know, operating on people's brains and we're thinking the parents are gonna kill us. And of course, all the kids are, yes, yes, show us more. And the parents are, no, no, no. <laughs> uh, and then he talked about, uh, uh, he's got, I don't know, some huge number of kids o o over the years. And he has, even though he's, he's gotta be in his eighties now, I guess, he's got an eight year old, uh, maybe granddaughter. Um, and talks about having her out on the farm and how you've got to get the girls out there and in the farm and you're in their hands. And here she is driving the tractor at eight, year old, eight years old. And again, we're figuring the parents are, are gonna disown us after this. But uh, in the end, I think everybody actually really enjoyed it. And you know, I think a lot of what he said about how uh, making sure that uh, the, the youngins, especially girls coming up are inspired and, and feeling technically uh, competentness to get them out there working. He said the reason I, I did such a good job repairing Hubble is because I worked on the farm. You know, I, I, I got my hands in everything. I knew how to repair tractors and do this. And, you know, my, my girls and, uh, you know, my uh, grandkids or whatever are going to know how to do this and use their hands and learn. And, um, you know, and certainly he was a premier performer uh, in, in doing the, the Hubble repairs. So it's hard to argue with his that. But the other interesting thing is, you know, we weren't sure if we we're going to be able to get him even then because he is getting so old and he's not doing a lot of talks anymore. And they, he called when he got to the observatory and I ran down to meet him in the lobby. And I got down there and this just looks like this little old man who's like, oh, Ken, I, you know, I'm, I'm glad I made it out here. And he's like, it looks like he's going to keel over. It's like, oh my God, you know, should we have brought him out here? And he goes like that, we go back and we get set and he goes out on stage and it's just like Christopher Reeve in the Superman movie. He straightens up, the glasses come up and he looks like Superman and he starts racing around the stage and he comes up to you in the audience and he's talking and pounding at you. And just, I mean, like he's 20 years old, the transformation was, was just amazing. And he, he went and he gave his talk and he may have given his talk twice that day. He went down in the autograph area and interact with people at the table for hours and just you know it's endlessly full of energy but you know you just you turn on the, the switch and he's still got it all um, it was amazing right baron has had his stand up face only thank you bill uh ken and carolyn that was a great presentation thank you very much thank you no, thank you um something that came across my mind early part of the presentation ken was when you were describing the uh, aspects of color and applying color filters to the monochrome images. And then when you went to Mars and showed the, the first picture of Mars and how the filters were applied to show the picture as our human eyes would see it, uh, it kind of crossed my mind as I used to teach color back in the university days when I was instructing then uh, that has there been research, I presume there has, but has there been research on the way color affects our eyes based on temperature? Because I know here on earth right now, it's like 85 degrees out here in Fort Lauderdale, but up on Mars, it's like what, 95 degrees below? And although there's no humidity and it looks like it's a nice arid, you know, <clears throat> midsummer day there, it's cold as heck. Uh, and I thought, 
you know, is there, has there been research or have you taken into consideration or do you know if, if the way the human perceives color varies based on temperature? I don't know that that's been taken directly into account. I think when we try to get the natural color image, we just try to get the, the distribution of light in the different wave bands and the different colors, you know, about uh, to correspond to the relative sensitivity of the eye and how it sees red versus green versus blue. Um, we, we do try our best to represent what we think the intensity is in the different colors. Uh, Carolyn mentioned in her slide of 75 missions and that map that showed the, the different missions and where they landed. Two of the earliest ones uh, that were there were the Viking uh, one and two landers that were on that. And I do remember when the first images came down there looking out from the rover toward the horizon, uh, there were huge arguments about the color of the sky the first couple of releases that came out looked to many people's minds way too blue. I mean, it looked like an earth atmosphere um, and people went back and, and did a, a bunch of recalibrations to get the rocks to look the right color in the sky. And that's in the end, a pretty strong constraint getting both of those right at the same time. And it gives you a, a clue as to when you, you've got it right. We do have some spectral information and, and things that gives us finer information on the, the colors of the, the various rocks and whatever. Um, so that is folded in or you know, increasingly folded in over the years to, to try to match it as, as strong as possible. And there's I others- I think they might get more concerned about the, the effect of temperature on the instruments. <laughs> that's, that's probably true. Um, yeah. Carol, my yeah. wife had a, a very philosophical uh, comment here. Given the photos of Mars that show no vegetation at all, I wonder how people would survive in that environment. I guess it might be like our last year in quarantine. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it's it's going to be like always living in a in, in a submarine, essentially. If they're not living underground, they're going to be in really sh well shielded. Uh, bits of their spacecraft, actually, the first ones, you know, there might be some materials sent ahead, but they're going to have to live in their space, whatever their landers are, and those will be shielded for uh, ultraviolet radiation, um, for the most part. Um, I, I'm not sure what other, you have temperature changes and that sort of thing. But yeah, it's you can't go outside, you can't just go skipping outside without putting on a spacesuit. Now, for the long term, they're certainly going to have to be able to grow food, like in a greenhouse yeah, type yeah. environment. Yeah. Um, so you bring along something to get through your first season, you know, and the yeah, potatoes rations. And then, yeah, we know from the Martian <laughs> that potatoes you know, probably are a, a good option. Um, yeah. I actually have, sorry for the dogs. I actually had a question. It's great to know that there might be water on Mars. How do we know it's drinkable water and not like the, uh, you know, the equivalent of the old poison water hole out west? Yeah, it's that's a good question. Yeah. I mean, they'll, I think, um, have we done any sampling of water? Not really. I mean, there is there has been think... a look at the ice near the poles. Um, yeah, certainly no. there's carbon dioxide ice, and you're not going to be drinking that, but there is water ice, and I suppose you'd have to prepare for filtering, but so there'll have to be some mission before we land people there to get some samples and study it. But I think that's the answer. It's going to have to be filtered or distilled or yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah. You could, you know, Bill, if you're fast, you can build the first still on Mars. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, that actually isn't all that far off. In some of the early mission plans that we talked about at Case for Mars, we were talking about stills. So, yeah. And, yeah, you know, they also are going to be using water for propulsion to get things for propulsion. And so they're going to need to know for that reason as well what's in the water. <clears throat> Great. Dave English has his hand up. So my question has to do with... Um, Color filters versus raw image data. So once when you put a filter in front of an image sensor, you're diminishing some of the light reaching the sensor. Actually, the question started right. in my mind with, how do you protect the integrity of the filters from the harsh environment on the surface so that they don't, uh, so that the filter filters the wavelength you think it's going to filter for the life of the fil filter. So why wouldn't you, for example, Walt Disney captured the original animated films on fine grain black and white film 
and shot three separate successive records so that you, they called it SE. And so mm -hmm. you'd have Bambi, you'd have the first black and white record through a yellow cyan magenta filter. And then you'd recombine those in the laboratory. And he did it because filter, color film was not um, sensitive enough. And he had his archival image. And even with the first CAPS image, which was a digital system, we recorded those off of a CRT film recorder through a filter wheel. So we had the longevity of the archival black and white footage. So my question really is with that as a perspective, why would you predetermine the color image information and send that image where you don't have the ability to separate it out? Why wouldn't you send the black and white image and then apply filters here? Well, and certainly in the in the, the Hubble case and in the, the standard space observatory, that is what we do. We, we radio down the individual images and the combination into color images is all done on the ground. And that's why sometimes you'll see different image releases come out that look different is that someone has tried a, a different way of combining things to highlight a different aspect of, of the imagery. Um, in the case of perseverance, I assume, well, I don't know if they do the interpolation uh, on the spacecraft or whether they do it on the ground. Because you remember there, each pixel has one of the RGB filters on it. So you could, in principle, at least get that raw image where you have the, the raw counts in each pixel, you know, in the color that corresponds to it, and then play uh, games with different ways of interpolating the image to improve either the resolution or the, you know, the color balance. But I don't is actually a, Is it a know. CMOS sensor? Is it a CMOS sensor? I for the not sure. I'm not sure in Perseverance, do you know? Looks like Carolyn's asking for advice in the background here. And she's muted. No, I did actually put in a link to the MassCam design page, but it doesn't say uh, what that what it's made of. I'm just trying to find that. But the other thing too is I think that you were in, you're asking about protecting it. I think it's it's encased in a protected case with the camera. But uh, but whether it's CMA, it might it probably is. And the, the other I question, wanna, I want to guess. The other yeah. question is: so we saw dust on the lens. Do they have any kind of uh, ultrasonic dust removal? Um, no. no, no. Although it's kind of interesting, one of the other rovers, the Mars Exploration rovers, had a lot of dust on its on its uh, um, solar cells, and they were really worried about the, the power drain on it. You know, was, wasn't getting enough power, and then suddenly they saw a big kick up of power. It turned out that one of these little Martian dust storms, these little dust devils, went over it and cleaned off the solar panel. So, but I don't think they're going to be hoping for for that. And in the as a matter of fact, the Perseverance helicopter had a, a problem with a lot of dust right. on it, and they didn't have as many as much wind as they were expecting, and they were dropping and wondering if they're going to be able to fly at all. Um, but they were able to get the first flight off quickly enough. Uh, and though, even though the design isn't necessarily to clean the solar cells, that first flight did get enough material off to really kick their power up and allowed them to continue on. And now that they're flying fairly regularly, um, you know, I think we're in good shape. Well, don't those rotors help get rid of some of it too? Well, that's, yeah, that's probably not enough wind generated. I, I've got to think about that. It's yeah. a very thin, thin atmosphere. Mm -hmm. you know? Well, David, I did post that uh, link if you want to look at it. You might. I haven't. I need to dig through it. Um, Ken, I posted the same link you and I used. They put more information in there now about the filtering. So, okay. They they keep updating from their press conferences, and they'll put new information on their pages too. So you are, you know, you're seeing us learn this stuff in almost real time here before we send it to you. It's, but it's, it's so, interesting too. It's, totally it's interesting amazing. too because the teams will start putting more information. They'll get a question in the press conference and then they'll go, oh, we better put that on the website. And then they put more up. So, so to be clear, the, how do I get to your links? Oh, it's, see oh, them in the in the yeah. on the in the chat. You can just click on the link. In the Zoom chat. If you need to see the chat, Dave, go down to the bottom of the screen. You should got see it. it. No, I got it. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Okay. 
I I took a quick screenshot of all the links, mm -hmm. and I'll just type from that. I was an idea I just put out there. If you watch the video after Bill posts it, and all your links come up, just take a quick snapshot of the page. Yeah, have them all saved. But let me just say, fantastic, fantastic lecture, guys. Thank you. Well, thank you. You know, we we're quite sure how it was going to go kind of off topic here, but we appreciate you guys showing up and giving us a shot. <laughs> yeah, the one thing about talking about missions, especially for perseverance is anything you say today might be then old news tomorrow. Things change constantly. And so when you go to the mission web pages, you need to go back every day or so and they'll put more and more information up. Some of it they don't put up right away just because they really have a mission to run. And they'll they'll get it up a little bit later, and so we were kind of running into that. They didn't have all the data up that we'd really like, but but they are getting the images up pretty quickly. Well, it's not oh, and the other thing too is that there's a whole citizen science thing about, and they'll do this with Hubble images too. But they're invited to take the Mars images and tweak the colors. So there's all these people out there who are imaging specialists who are grabbing. The, the black and whites and the raw images, and there's a raw image site on the Mars mission, and they're cranking out stuff that is sometimes is more gorgeous than what the mission is giving us. And and I follow some of them on Facebook. They're really doing some nice work. Greg Apar had his hand up. Greg, you there? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I have a question, and I don't mean this in, the mo in a facetious way at all, and those who know me know that I'm not being sarcastic or facetious or trying to be funny. You were talking about Star Trek and how art meets reality. How did you guys, or do you know anyone over the years, how did you guys feel about I Dream of Genie? <laughs> I thought it was a really great show, but I was a kid when it came on. Yeah, I was going to say, I wasn't yeah, uh, ultra yeah. critically thinking at the age that I enjoyed it and may have been appreciated things above and beyond the, the, uh, the science in that show. Well, I think all of us wanted to be Jeannie, who were girls, you know, she got to be with this astronaut and, you know. See, I, I, to me, everybody talks about Star Trek and, you know, how. You know, we just lost you, Greg. Lost you. Well, I enjoyed, while well, Greg is coming back, I enjoyed I Dream of Jeannie at times because they would actually show bits of the mm -hmm. astronauts going. Yeah. To various facilities. And the first time I went to work down at the so to be able to walk into the same buildings I had seen was a real kick to me. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, that, that was that's what kind of uh, showed the space program on a regular basis to kids growing up on in syndication every day. That was a television show that, you know, where his job was being an astronaut. So it was yeah, and, it, and that attracted me too. I mean, it was um, the fact that, you know, it was a mixture of fantasy and, and science, but I always thought, oh, this is NASA. And NASA was becoming this really cool thing that everybody wanted to be part of. And it was getting included in these cultural, uh, these cultural products. I, I, yeah, I see if, you. You may have wanted to be a uh, you know, genie or something. I always wanted to be Roger Keeley because he had the right idea. Yeah. <laughs> he uses mountains of gold and other stuff, yeah. you know. Tony was, you know, so damn practical, but Roger Healy, he knew he was going to be the sultan of the world. He was my idol. Yeah, yeah. I think even back then, but especially now, I'm still of the mind bent to not. I don't, I'm not one of those science types that wants to go in and, and pick uh, about all the flaws of a movie or something. I tend to go in at least the first time and just enjoy it. And, you know, sure, I'll have conversations with colleagues about, you know, this being wrong or that being wrong. But, you know, I, I think it's a, a, a waste of time to go in there. Just, you know, you got to enjoy it sometimes just for, for art's sake. And I, I saw a uh, interview uh, just a couple of uh, days ago, um, Chantel Van Satten, who stars, one of the stars in For All Mankind, managed to snag an interview with Scott Kelly, uh, the uh, astronaut who was uh, one of the two brothers astronauts he was up on ISS for a year and she was uh, talking with him about it and at one point talked about um, how he viewed these you know, space movies and, and whether he could watch them or whether he was completely unhappy with how unrealistic they were he said no I, I go into these things and I just enjoy it. you know I you know I love gravity even though you know that was a bizarre, bizarre non-physical stuff and you know how they're going from one orbit to another with you know infinite energy requirements so, yeah. you know just ignore that because you know you can enjoy that and he he said the fact and i just have to tell this story it's not super related to what we're talking about 
but she said, you know what, what is one of your highlights from ISS? She said, well, we actually got to watch as a group on ISS, the movie Gravity. And while we were mm. watching it, you know, there's a, a scene where Sandra Bullock, I guess, is floating through the interior of ISS. She said, when that scene showed up on the screen, astronaut Samantha Christopher Reddy, who was on board at the same time, just happened to float out of the adjacent tunnel and kind of like floated through the cabin in parallel to what Sandra Bullock was going on screen. And I thought I had never heard that story. And I thought that was just so cool. You know, Ken, didn't it kind of freak you out when you saw the Hubble Space Telescope get destroyed though? Yes. Uh, <laughs> Me too. That, that's a little hard to watch. I also, <laughs> when you were talking about the Disney mission space ride and how the uh, earlier version flew by Hubble, you know, part of me said, hey, cool, that's Hubble. And part of me said, who, who, who's the navigator on this thing? I want to talk to them about flying that close to our <laughs> telescope. Well, look at how close it flew to um, the International Space Station. It goes right through the It's like in real life, you'd never yeah. fly anything that close to a, a prime yeah. NASA. I mean, I, I go to movies, and, and unless there's just something that really stands out, I mean, I won't say anything out loud, but I'll think to myself, well, that was stupid. No, that can't happen, you know, or whatever. <laughs> but, but most of the time, I'm just watching it for the for the sheer joy of it, if, if that's what we're there to see. I mean, Star Wars is, none of well, that would ever happen, right? You know, it's yeah, Star that, that, Wars. That's in science fantasy. Oh, just that's enjoy way that. here, yeah. yeah. For fantasy, don't worry about it being, it's not attempting to be hard sci-fi, so that's yeah, okay. One thing I got to tell you guys is about this time every year, Ken and I would be in Denver at Starfest which is a media con that regularly pulls in three, I don't know, a couple thousand people. And Ken has been our, our uh, sort of our star science lecturer for how many years, four or five years now, but they've canceled them because of COVID. So we haven't been having them. So this is kind of our star fest weekend. And, you know, I, I must say rubbing <laughs> shoulders with you guys is just as exciting as rubbing shoulders yeah. with the stars of Trek. Oh, oh, you should you should see you should see him at Trek. Well, you know, I take him to the meet and greet on Saturday night or Friday night, and and there's like a movie star standing over there, and he's right there. You know, hi, I'm Ken Cap Carpenter, and I'm from NASA. You know, and he's it's just great to Gotta watch him work. Take advantage of the affiliation while you can. Oh, of course, you know? yeah, yeah. I mean, I actually, the, I'm there. I'm there working. You're there having a great time, right? So the Starfest has a lot of the usual stuff, you know, the lectures and panels, discussion and autographs. But one thing they do that I don't see many other cons is they have this thing called a meet and greet on Friday night before things really start and they sell separate tickets to it and they've set up like 11 or 12 tables big round tables that hold eight or ten people each in a you know, like a gym or something or a, a ballroom and the idea is they people go and sit at these tables and there's one empty chair at each table and then they pick 12 of us who are the performers at the show and you know a third of them are or actual TV stars, a third of them might be technical people or film people, and then there's some scientists thrown into the mix. And we, you know, seven o'clock, the bell rings, we go in and we each sit at one of the tables, and the table gets five minutes with us. And they can it's ask like speed questions. dating in reverse. Yeah, yeah, it is. And, you know, we can either do a monologue or they can ask questions and go. And then the bell rings, and you all have to switch tables. And it's been just uh, amazing. I mean, the people who go to those things are really into it and at least make a very strong pretense of getting as excited about the science as they do about meeting, you know, the, the star yeah. of the, the latest show or something. I was gonna say, you know, uh, Patrick Stewart, but no, they get more excited about Patrick Stewart, but anybody else, you know, um, they would go. And you, well, you they get, know you now too. They know you now too, so. And you sometimes you get a chance to interact with one of the stars too. There's uh, um, one, uh, an actor named, um, I forget his first name. His last name is Kane, and he has a career of playing the the ruffian, the you know the the muscle in, in every oh, show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he and I were he was following. Now I was following him around this this meet and greet room. And one time I finished earlier, and he got up there and hey, you're sitting in my seat. And he, he got up very graciously, and I, I sat down and I made the mistake of talking too quickly to the table and say, boy, I never thought I'd get the towel game to, to, to get up and leave and get out of my seat. He flipped around, came back to me and said, I want my seat back. And then he did his <laughs> best. <laughs> it was hilarious. <coughs> so we kept doing that as we went, as we were around just because it was so much fun. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah, my wife refuses to watch uh, submarine movies with me because all I'll do is point out all the things that don't really work that way on submarines. And then uh, she knows not to watch cop shows with me. So, uh, 
Well, Bill, actually, if it's a group of scientists going to a movie, yeah, then we'll we'll do it, you know. But yeah. but most of the time, the first run through, you're just watching it and seeing, it, you know, have a good time. Just enjoy oh, yeah, it. Yeah. You just have to sit back and enjoy it. Yeah. Well, I found this all fascinating. I think from the number of people that stayed with us through the whole time, uh, others did as well. So I thank you both for taking time out of your Saturday to to do this. Like I said, uh, Carol and I, uh, we got the uh, tour down at Goddard. They were building the new uh, web uh, observatory and uh, hmm. uh, great fun to watch them do it. And, you know, Kenneth was real excited because whatever they were doing that day was the first time they had done something. And I pointed out to him the first time every day you do something is probably the first time it's ever been done. <laughs> so, uh, but we were really fascinated by it. And as I mentioned, Carol was uh, just blown away by the, the beauty of the, the pictures, the various uh, nebula and all the, the rest of it. So appreciate it. No, uh, you have to understand that what I was looking at was the beauty and not at all what it represented. Because I don't even understand a tenth of what you what you do every day, you guys. But but I really appreciate it. And if I live to be like a thousand years old, I might master some of this stuff. Well, you know that, that's the beauty of it, Carol, is that it's I think making as much of a contribution in the area of of art as it is in science. And sometimes yeah. different people appreciate it different ways, but you can't look at some of these images without being blown away. Oh, it's amazing. And, you know, even yeah. a scientist will do that and just disengage for a while and say, that's the prettiest thing I've seen, yeah. you know, in years or whatever. I can't oh, Carol. That one, the one um, picture that, I, that impressed me the most was like a seahorse or a... Uh, starfish or something like but that the, probably the horse had nebula yeah that's what it was yes okay <laughs> Yeah, one Someday. thing I'll, I'll, I'll add to this is that we, we have these astronomy meetings every year, usually in person, but not for the last two years. And every year that the Hubble will put up a big picture of their latest image. And sometimes you'll walk into this, and it'll be like 10 feet tall and spread across a giant board. And you'll walk in and there'll be, you know, astronomers who've been doing this for 30, 40 years, and they're just totally taken, taken aback by the, the beauty of the image. The other thing I'll say is, um, you know, it's been really educational for me to come in here. Every one of you guys talk about the work you do, um, particularly the Disney folks, since I've been trying to educate myself a little bit more about that in terms of how I can apply Disney principles to exhibits. And so this is my way of thanking you guys for everything you've shared, because I've really learned a lot from all of you. It is an interesting experience going to Disney with, with Carol and you bring her into some place like the uh, what's it, Nemo show <laughs> at Animal Kingdom. And it's like, she's down, she's talking to the people at the consoles that are it's like, sit back and enjoy the show. And you know, and everything we're watching is, how'd they do that? It's like, <laughs> watch it once and then I find out that. how they do I that. Did all that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and, and, and Carol, you know, you, you talk about how you appreciate the, the art and whatever. You know, you, you work at the Getty, right? I think you ought to orchestrate some kind yeah. of exhibit after they open back up. Uh, actually, I, not an exhibit, but my my partner and I have have um, uh, developed a second tour of some items at the Getty. And if, it, if you guys are interested, we could try it out on you one Saturday. Yeah, I was just going to mention that some people, when Carol was getting ready to do her first online tour, some people joined us, I think, on a Monday as a uh, walkthrough and enjoyed it. But yeah, whenever people would like to see more of the Getty uh, again, we're all still living kind of virtually out here. The museum's not yet open out to the public. They're just getting started on it. But uh, if, how many people would like to see a behind the scenes uh, look at some of the neat stuff at the Getty? Well, it's not really behind the scenes. It's it's <laughs> behind the closed doors. It's part of the collection. It's part of the collection. Yeah, I think I missed your first one, Carol. So I would love to see you do something again even I if it's even different do the first one again oh i would too practicing yeah. to see if it would come together and uh, we have another one it's called cachet of the crown and it's called decorative arts which is one of the things that that j paul getty um uh, collected a lot of but everything was artistic in those days even though it had use a lot of the the things had actually useful purposes in in there, well, well, I was going to say real life, but it wasn't real life. It was the, you know, the, the uh, rich and, and famous, maybe. <laughs> well, Carol, if I would love to see that. Okay. At the I, comments, people are voting yes. That they want okay. you to talk. We'll, we'll figure out what day we can do it, but, but certainly we can. We have another whole tour prepared. Excellent. 
Great. And uh, if we can't convince Carol for next week, I'll come up with another World's Fair type of uh, thing for next week. Two weeks from now is Disneyland in 3D. Again, reminding people, if you already have your 3D glasses, great. If not, uh, send your self-addressed stamp envelope to Dave, and he will uh, send them. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, Dave English, I got your check, and uh, I just got the books the same day I got your check, so I'll be uh, mailing those out uh, on, on Monday. That's the, uh, oh, where it is. We'll go to the shameless plug or advertising. The uh, book on the 39 San Francisco World's Fair comes out on the 10th. I now have a copy, so for people that pre-ordered it, I will mail them out on the uh, uh, third, and then uh, hopefully you'll have them all, and you can say, hey, I've got something before everybody else does. So uh, again, appreciate it. Uh, Kenneth, I've got yours put off to the side for you. So uh, okay, thank you. Uh, again, appreciate it. Any other questions people have for Kenneth or Carolyn? Again, beautiful art, and again, the technology of uh, doing this is uh, interesting. I had not realized until you mentioned it how big the rover is. And when you were showing me the pictures the other day, I was kind of impressed it was leaving all those tracks on the surface, and now I realize just how heavy the thing is. You know, I, I, I thought it was maybe a quarter of the size. Uh, you know, I didn't realize it was the size of a car. Uh, Kenneth, how long is the Hubble? Small for car, yeah. Uh, Hubble is 43 feet feet long. It's about the size of a school bus. Fills the entire shuttle bay. Yeah, absolutely and astonishing it, to think that you could throw this stuff up in space and do this, this stuff. It was, to some degree, the shuttle and the telescope were designed for each other. The telescope was made a little bit smaller. The shuttle might have been made a little bit larger to because they knew it would be one of the prime motivators uh, for the shuttle was the involvement um, with that. There is, by the way, that recently came out, Lego just put out a brand new set with Shuttle Discovery and Hubble there. It's a, you have to be pretty serious modeler. It's, a, you know, it's, I think it's $200 and it's got wow. 3,000 parts, I think. I've seen people do it, or not in person, but, you know, the, they've shown it. Uh, and it's really quite well done. So a lot of my colleagues, you know, the real professionals are going gaga over the Lego set. <laughs> Somebody also mentioned that the shuttle was made to hold the uh, keyhole satellites. And uh, one of my friends who's a designer in that, you know, I've often joked with him about doing a talk like this. And he goes, yeah, I can tell you, but I don't have to kill you all, so. <laughs> it would be all dark slides. Yeah. <laughs> it was actually interesting. He and I worked in the Polaris Poseidon Trident program together. And then he uh, was recruited to go off into the, uh, the keyhole stuff. So uh, he had a very fascinating side career after he left uh, left what we were doing. And we, uh, we, we were down at the uh, uh, National, the Aerospace Museum, the facility out at uh, Dulles. And uh, we had a great time walking through old home week, looking at all the uh, Polaris Poseidon craft that we designed that's now on display in the museum, which if you ever want to feel old, see something you design on display in the museum. <laughs> It's really kind of humbling. As a matter of fact, Bill, we were at the Experience Music Project in Seattle one year, and my husband's a composer, and we found a lot of his equipment behind glass with little cards describing it. We're like, this can't be. <laughs> Sorry. Well, so I, we Bill, I do see one other question that we missed before someone asked. Scott asked if the is there no way ISS could meet up with Hubble, uh, correct? And, and that, that is true. They're in radically different inclination orbits so, and Hubble doesn't have any propulsion and there's no way that ISS would have enough propulsion to change orbits um, by that amount. That's one of the non-physical things in gravity. You couldn't, even an astronaut would have a really hard time getting from one to the other just because when you change the orbital tilt, it takes a lot of energy. So next week, uh, somebody suggested a revisit to the San Francisco World's Fair. I might do that. I might go back to Seattle because that's the one I blew the recording on. Uh, and if I get this things done in time, it might be Hemisphere. So uh, we'll see what we come up with. Or it might be Carol if her partner is available. So, <laughs> I, suggest, I suggest telling Carol about, uh, I don't know, 7 p.m. Friday night. <laughs> you know, I did have one night where somebody was supposed to do the talk and I got this very frantic thing from my internet went out. Uh, remember Don? <laughs> oh yeah, believe me, I remember that. It burned in my memory.
Yeah, my internet's out and the ETA is Tuesday. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> but luckily, uh, uh, Spectrum, Comcast, uh, Cox, whoever it is down there uh, came to the rescue. But I was like 10 o'clock on a Friday night and like, oh. Was that Route 66? Yeah. yeah. That was the Route 66 first presentation. Yeah. yeah. I keep telling my daughter, if we ever run out of subjects, I'm just going to do her baby photos and then she can pay me not to. So. <laughs> Well, again, appreciate it all. And again, to my friends at Disney, uh, you know, again, if you would like to chat about any of your other past projects that are not under NDAs or anything, please uh, do feel free. I mean, sometimes things a little technically go over my head and I can see other people nodding that they're eating it up and enjoying it. So, uh, you know, again, uh, I appreciate this. I knew, you know, that the, the filter, the pictures were sent back to different elements. It's like when I'm restoring pictures, there's a little bit of artistic license, just how blue is the sky, how red is the person's sweater or whatever. But the, uh, I think the impact that to me and Carol, when we walked through Goddard, is just looking at all those dots and realizing how many planets are orbiting around all those dots. I think we're damn lucky that the Independence Day hasn't come to the being yet. None of them have shown up here. So, hey, and we're very lucky that we're the planet that's got Disney. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> As far as you know. <laughs> well, that's true. That's true. <laughs> yeah, as far as we know. Yeah, the Could mouse has gone universe places you don't know about yet. Could be, Could be a mirror universe, universe. Yeah. Where, where Disney is evil, you know. <laughs> There's a lot of people here are convinced that already. Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting thought. <laughs> <laughs> great. Well, thank you all. Hope you have a great Saturday, and we'll uh, see you for something next Saturday. Announce it as soon as I get it locked down. Sounds good. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Bill. Thank you all for showing up. Thank you. Thank you much. Bye. Bye-bye.